Spider Gwen is also known as Ghost Spider, is also known as Gwenum. Depending on what version of the Spider Gwen situation you want to be looking at, and today we're going to be looking at all of it with a full story video. A full story video is a bunch of complete stories, and a complete story here at Comic Storian is us taking your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and breaking them down into digestible bites to help you understand what is going on in your favorite world of comics and allow me to dramatically read it back to you. Today we're going to be looking at the Spider Gwen storyline, which spanned multiple volumes in multiple Marvel reboots. So basically we're going to start with her origin and we're going to go all the way to the ending where she gets a symbiote and i hope you guys enjoy this character has been getting more and more popularity just due to her showing up everywhere and she's become one of my favorite spider people so i hope you agree with me by the end of our video spider gwen is from an alternate universe in which she was bitten by the radioactive spider and peter parker was not she became something special known as spider woman and peter grew jealous of how special she was so he tried to change himself, and he became known as the villain, Lizard. This eventually led to his death. Spider-Woman and Peter Parker would fight it out, and in the end, he would die. And the police would show up just in time to see a normal-looking Peter Parker and a sad Spider-Woman holding him in her lap. Because of that, she found herself on the run from the police, and the Kingpin wanted her to work for him. This led her to fight against Kingpin's men and rescue her father, Captain Stacy, from his own death. But by rescuing him, she revealed her identity to her father. Shocked by the news that his own daughter was Spider-Woman, she left telling him that she was needed in this role. Someone was needed to save the day. She then got ramped up in the Spider-Verse mess, but now she's back home, coping with the events that had unfolded just before she left. While she was gone, Vulture was raging through the town and the people of New York were questioning where their Spider-Woman had gone, even though no one apparently wanted her around before she left. She's been dodging phone calls from her band, the Mary Janes also. How can she fix all of this? As she walks through town returning stolen cash registers and pondering the answer to that question, she sees her old band, the Mary Janes, are continuing on without their star drummer. Well, at least they're trying. Their hit single, Face It Tiger, is soaring in the charts, and Mary Jane has too much pride to ask Gwen Stacy back into the band, even though the rest of the band wants her back. What you may have missed in our previous episode is that Gwen effectively quit the band at one of their biggest shows. So after debating if she should talk to her father, go talk to the band, or get the Vulture in custody, Gwen decides that she's going to fix this whole mess by starting with the Vulture. The town will love her again if she does this, she'll be back in her dad's good graces, and then she can go talk to Mary Jane. So she grabs the Vulture's public address that the police have put out on the internet, and she breaks into his apartment to steal his spray paint and paint messages all over the town. Things like, death from a butt, the Vulture stinks, and your nest is a hot mess. Of course, this does get his attention, and he comes screaming in, ready to fight. But her spider sense saves her as she jumps backwards, webbing him up, yelling, KISS DEES! Blinded by the webbing over his eyes, he crash lands into a local apartment, and Spider-Woman leaps in behind him. Aw, oh, you don't want to play anymore, Toomsie? Taking your ball and going home? The vulture screams and charges right at her, only for her to dodge again and web him from behind. Now, ah, you old fart, we're just getting started. But finally, the Vulture is getting an upper hand as he pulls Spider-Woman up into the sky with him, and he goes higher and higher. She begins to think to herself, oh no, we're too high! And that's when the Vulture drops her. She begins to plummet back to the earth down below and is knocked unconscious from the fall. A few hours pass and Spider-Woman begins to snap out of it and listens to a song being sung nearby. Spider-Gwen, Spider-Gwen, sleeping on the job again. A faint smell of trash clearly indicates that she's in a trash pile, and as her eyes begin to focus, she can see who was singing. Spider-Ham is standing over her. Wait, Spider-Ham? For those of you who aren't fully aware of the Spider-Man universe, Spider-Ham is another version called Peter Porker, and Spider-Gwen met him when she was on her Spider-Verse adventure. But he can't be here, and he quickly confirms that he is nothing more than a figment of her imagination. Once she realizes that Spider-Ham isn't really there, she leans over the sign to get ready to puke, telling herself, how could she lose to him, to the Vulture? Ah, oh, stop it, Spider-Ham tells her. You did fine. Lose a fight with Baron Zero, then we'll have a self-pity talk. That's when she remembers how she saved herself. At the last second, she used her webbing to glide and she landed face first into the trash. She sits down in shock that she lost to that old geezer. Yeah, but all things considered, Severe head trauma is a low toll to pay. How about we regroup, go home, and... But Spider-Gwen looks at her imaginary friend. Home? I can't go home! I can't even work up the nerve to talk to my dad. Oh no. She begins to scramble around the trash, and Spider-Ham asks her, What are you looking for? 
My phone! I lost my phone! Well, the world weeps for your electronics, but you can't just get- And Spider-Woman grabs Spider-Ham. My whole life is in that phone! All of my secrets! Meanwhile, the phone has been found by the police, and Captain Stacy would recognize his daughter's phone anywhere. He works it out and he puts the phone into his daughter's backpack, cursing her for making him take evidence from the crime scene. Apparently, she's so out of whack that Gwen eventually found herself in a random bar in Manhattan, and she was picked up by her friends. Though she still doesn't know why she's still seeing Spider-Ham. Immediately, MJ and the rest of her bandmates begin to fight about the whole should Gwen be back in the band thing. And Gwen looks over at Spider-Ham. Why did you bring me here? You knew this would happen. Spider-Ham tells her, Being a superhero is more than just facing against the bad guys Gwen's day. Sometimes, you gotta face real life. With all of them arguing about whether or not she should be back in the band or not, she looks at Spider-Ham. I'm sorry, I just can't. Not yet. She gets up and she apologizes, telling everyone that she's just gonna go. But MJ stops her. For real? You can't. Look at us. The Mary Janes need you. Meanwhile, Captain Frank Castle is trying to get a lead on who this Spider-Woman is. Because in this world, he's not the Punisher. He's a police detective. While Matt Murdock, not the Daredevil, but the Kingpin's lackey in this world, is trying to beat on the Vulture for battling against Spider-Woman. She's the Kingpin's to take care of, and the Vulture has no right to get involved. Spider-Woman suits back up and she hits the streets with her imaginary friend. Maybe she does have brain damage or something. And as they swing around, she tells them that she needs to do this. She'll deal with the Mary Janes after she handles the Vulture. And Spider-Ham tells her, You're doing this for the wrong reasons, Gwen. None of this will change the past. So she decides that she's going to take the Cartoon Pig's advice for the first time. And she's going to swing by to visit her father. She meets him at a bar and they head back to their place so that she can take off the Spider-Woman costume. And the first thing her father says to her is that she can't be Spider-Woman. She just can't do it anymore. But she looks to her dad. I looked into Peter's eyes, Dad. I felt his heartbreak. Captain Stacy looks at his daughter and sees her in pain. And he tells her, You have to trust me, Gwen. To know. But she cuts him off. To know what's best? I'd give anything to stop lying and stop hiding behind this mask. But then how would I help anyone? Gwen Stacy is the problem, Dad. If you can't forgive yourself for what happened to Peter, Gwen, no one else can. But at that exact moment, Gwen's spider sense begins to blare as the vulture comes crashing through the window. He throws Captain Stacy back and he fills the room up with his vulture gas. He then grabs Captain Stacy by the shirt and he holds him up. Come clean! Why do the Kingpin's men save you from me? Who is Spider-Woman to you? Gwen sees her chance and she crawls away to suit up. You're no match for my tiger style, Vulture. She yells out to get his attention. And she begins to beat on him with stuff that she webbed together to make nunchucks. She starts to win this match against him, but he begins to declare the stakes are too high now. The Kingpin wants her dead. And then the gas begins to affect her and she begins to cough madly. The Vulture stands up giving his evil villain montage, only to be shot in the shoulder by Captain Stacy. Clutching his bullet wound, he takes off from the building, leaving Captain Stacy and Gwen alone. She gets up, getting ready to continue her fight with the Vulture, but her father holds her back. No, Gwen, I won't let you go. So, she webs him to the ground and follows, because she has to. She's the only one that can. She finds the Vulture trying to steal a police car with his gases going crazy all over the place. And with her vision blurring, she takes a few more swings and she knocks out the Vulture. She then starts to stumble away as she hears the police sirens approaching. But she can't get away, this gas is making her just so sleepy. And she stumbles into Captain Castle, now wearing a t-shirt with a skull, holding two batons, and a gas mask. The radio asks if he wants backup, but he tells them that he has this. She's his. And he begins to take a swing at her, but now she's getting mad. So she breaks his batons, and she flings him onto the hood of a police car. And then she begins to punch him over and over. I'm tired of all of you! All of you jackbooted fascists and you loud-mouthed newspaper jerks! But Frank turns on the electrical currents that shot Gwen off of him, throwing her back off to the ground. She lands dazed, and Frank walks over, removing her mask. And then he looks in shock. What the frack? How? You're just a... But Gwen finishes his line for him. Just a girl? Yeah, that's right. I'm just a girl. And she punches him into a nearby car so hard that he lands unconscious. She reaches down and she grabs her mask. I've been sloppy and stupid. Dad was right. I can't let the vulture possibly figure out who I am. No more head games. No more spinning myself in circles. There's no other choice here. Spider-Woman's not a criminal. Meanwhile, Ben Parker, Captain Stacy's next door neighbor, arrives and he helps him out of the building. Gwen stops a few more crimes the next day, but the vulture's been captured by the police and he's been hauled off. 
She's not quite sure where and how she should go forward, but she knows that she needs to be a superhero. But she eventually decides that she's going to go check on her father. She's going to go to the Parkers, a place that she hasn't been since Peter died. It shouldn't be too hard, right? As Gwen arrives at the front door, she debates if she should even knock. But Ben Parker sees her and he invites her in quietly because her father is asleep on the couch and he doesn't want to wake her. He then sits her down at the table where she sees scrapbooks in front of her. They were out because May Parker was cleaning. Talk about a day of coincidences. The Parkers are super excited to see Gwen because they really haven't seen her since Peter died. But Gwen can't even hear their kind words, not with the newspaper clippings in front of her. The one stating, Peter died, and it's all Spider Woman's fault. She can't take it, it's too much, and she begins to get up and leave, but May Parker asks her to stay. They haven't seen her in months. She looks down. I can't. I shouldn't, May. She thinks to herself, there are just too many reminders in this house. How could she move forward when everywhere she looks around, she's reminded of Peter's death by her hands? But May holds her chin in her hands. We can. We can do this together. It's Peter. That's why you're here, isn't it, dear? I'm having a hard time with Spider Woman, May says. And Gwen stops. What do you mean? I don't know where to begin. But I knew when she showed up that Peter was in love. He was in love with the idea of her Gwen, the power of it, the freedom, the fantasy. He was brilliant and he lived in a world all by himself in his head. I don't know if it was the children ridiculing him or beating him, but maybe he just felt trapped with two old farts like Ben and me. Regardless of what his reasoning was, he was trapped, alone in his own world in his head, and he wasn't well. When he died, Jameson threw a microphone in my face and I looked for someone to blame. And I thought, why not Spider Woman? She fled from the scene, from the police, and she wears a mask. But something felt wrong. Peter and I started cutting clips of Spider Woman when he was alive, and when he died, I just kept going. But I saw something in all these clippings. I started to see a different picture. I saw her trying, trying to make up for something, to set it right. For Peter, wouldn't that mean she's guilty? Gwen asks her. Maybe, but what would you do if the world judged you like that? Who could you even trust? Maybe she's trapped in her own head too. Maybe it's just easier to be someone that's behind that mask than pretend that she has no choice. All I know is that Peter is as much a part of us as we are a part of him. And if we want the love that we have for him to live on, we can't hide either. It's up to us to carry on living. And with those words, Gwen picks herself up and she leaves the house. She decides that May's right. She needs to carry on living. She needs to put her best foot forward, live her life, and stop blaming herself for what happened. So, she goes to the concert that the Mary Janes are going to be playing at that night. She apologizes to them. But they're fine. As much as they need her, they know that she needs them too. And she lives. She lives to the best of her ability, one day at a time. They play Madison Square Garden, opening up for Felicia Hardy and the Black Cats. Spider Woman gets involved in a battle against ninjas that are after the Black Cats, and then she meets Matt Murdock himself. Gabby is currently in their apartment playing with Jonathan, a pet Wolverine that she picked up. She smiles as she puts a mask on his face, telling him that they need to hide his identity. And then there's a shriek from Laura's bedroom, and Gabby goes to check it out, finding Laura in full costume, telling her to stay back. She leaps out the window, putting her fingers into the pose to thwip a web line, but of course she doesn't have web shooters and belly flops onto the roof of a car. Gabby rushes down in her pajamas, asking Laura, what was that all about? And Laura turns to her, who's Laura? I'm Gwen Stacy. Meanwhile, on Earth 65, Gwen Stacy, who is also known as Spider Woman on this earth suddenly forgot how to play the drums while on stage with her band. The Mary Janes all look at her like, what are you doing? And she tries to slam down the drumsticks only to put her hands through the drum because Gwen Stacy has super strength. Mary Jane asks her for the drumsticks and then she realizes that she can't get them off of her sticky hands and she just takes off of the door. She runs outside to find her father waiting for her and when she gets into the car, she shuts the door so hard that she breaks the glass. Super confused, her father brings her home and an aircraft lands in their backyard. A kid walks out telling them, my name is Reed Richards, and then he walks in telling her father that he's, um, friends with Gwen, and he whispers to her, you might want to get your Spider Woman suit, which is upstairs. Confused as always, she goes up grabbing the suit, and then Reed takes off into the skies and explains everything that is going on. Gwen Stacy is from Earth-65, and Laura Kinney is from Marvel Prime, and they've body swamped across dimensions. The big problem is that in three hours, the body swamp will reverse, and since they are currently occupying each other's bodies, they'll have nowhere to go and poof, 
they'll be gone. So what they need to do is find each other and then find a way to swap back within three hours. Luckily, Reed is super smart and he can teleport her back to Marvel Prime. Meanwhile, back at the apartment with Gabby and Laura, Laura is trying to explain that she isn't who Gabby thinks she is. She's actually a girl named Gwen Stacy. Gabby explains that it's not that she doesn't believe her, but, well, she took a pretty big hit to her head. Her brain might still be healing. Then there's a knock at the door and Gwen walks in and both of them know exactly what this means. Now, for the sake of not confusing anybody even further because it's already going to be confusing, we're going to keep calling everyone by the body that they're in. So, the person in Gwen's body will be calling Gwen and the person in Laura's body will be calling Laura. Hopefully, that makes it less confusing. They realize that they have body swamped and Gwen explains to Laura that they have to swamp back within three hours or this is permanent. It, or they're going to die. So Gwen asks Laura to come to the window where she was hit with a blast and look across. She sees what looks like a gun and she tells Gwen to swing over there since she has web shooters that allow her to swing around. But Gwen isn't stupid. Let me guess. I'll try and then I'll fall and I'll hurt myself. So I'm gonna walk. Laura agrees, telling her that maybe it's best that she doesn't break her body before she gets back into it. On the other side of the street, Gwen kicks in the door and asks Laura, How strong are you? And Laura tells her, I broke a lot of treasured things before I figured that out. Inside, they find the gun, which is now broken by the door that Gwen kicked in. And then Laura picks up the scent of the person who used it. She keeps sniffing the air, and then she mentions how dumb she feels sniffing the air. But Gwen assures her, You're unkillable with metal claws that pop out of your hands and feet. Don't worry, you're not dumb. This, of course, is a reason to pause for Laura. Wait, I have claws in my feet and fists? Does it hurt? Have you ever had a paper cut on the webbing of your hands and feet? No, that sounds terrible! Well, this is knives coming out of them. Okay, I'm not doing that. Laura points to a basement where Gwen tears the doors off of it and they step inside. And then Gwen stops as the alarms are going off in her head. And Laura tells her that that's spider sense! A flamethrower bursts out of the ground and it begins to try and roast them. Gwen grabs Laura and tries to shield her from the fire, but Laura wants to know what is she doing? Trying to save you. Well, don't! You're your body heals, mine doesn't. That's a very good point, Gwen tells her. That's when someone in a flying hornet suit arrives in front of them, demanding to know why they're here. She swoops in, opening fire on them, so Laura tells Gwen to use her webs, and Gwen takes aim and hits the ceiling. The flying robot person then opens fire on them again, so Laura grabs Gwen, getting her out of the path of destruction. Then Gwen thwips onto the hornet, pulling them down, and the hornet blasts Gwen into the wall. Thinking her body's been killed, Laura turns to the person, demanding to know who she is and why is she doing this. She begins to angrily shake her fist in front of her face, and Gwen tries to tell her to stop, but it's too late. With that anger, Laura pops her claws into her own head, dropping herself. The robot girl lands and pulls her helmet off, deciding that she's gonna be sick, watching someone stab themselves in the head. Gwen walks over, demanding to know what's going on, and the woman explains that she fired her beam into Wolverine's apartment to get him. You know, the short and hairy guy? So who is the girl on the ground, and who are you? Gwen explains that her, well, the real her, is the new Wolverine. Logan was killed, and she is his daughter. The mystery woman is surprised. She had no idea. She's been living in this basement, living off ramen noodles for years. Years, all to build the teleporter to send Wolverine away. She couldn't kill him. She just wanted him gone. Gwen walks over and retracts the claws from Laura's head so that she can heal, and Gwen asks the mystery woman why she wanted to send him away. And as it turns out, her uncle was the original Hornet, and Logan killed him. While she explains, Laura wakes up curious as to what actually happened. And since none of this is what Hornet wanted, she agrees to help them both get into their right spots in their own universes in the right bodies. Gwen walks over and she waves goodbye as Hornet warps her away. And then Laura goes to the same spot and is put back in her body. And Hornet says, Hi! I'm Melinda. And Laura tells her her name. Laura then begins to talk about what's next and ask Melinda if she'd like to work with her. She's not going to hold an urge for revenge against her because that's kind of what her entire family's about. And then with a fwash, Melinda teleports Laura back to her apartment where Gabby and Jonathan are cheerful that she's returned. Earth 65. It's another day for Gwen Stacy as she swings through stopping a few robbers from breaking into a diamond store. What's different though is that there's someone watching her. The man reports back stating that he'll keep an eye on her, but she tends to disappear. A little while later, in a quick change, Gwen sighs to herself as she hits a button on her watch and then a big purple vortex begins to swirl in front of her. After passing through and allowing the vortex to close, she appears in Earth 616. She appears in the current Marvel Prime universe. As she steps out, she's trying to remember the line to a song, and Cindy Moon is there to greet her by finishing the line. Gwen asks if she'll be joining them for brunch, and she tells her yes. But after an awkward amount of silence, Gwen says, You wanna? And Cindy finishes it with, Yeah, let's. 
The two leave for Jessica Drew's apartment, and when they get there, the place is a complete wreck because Jessica's had her baby. Cindy tells Jessica that they can stay in, but Jessica stops her. No, I need adult time. And just then, the sitter arrives ringing the doorbell. Roger says that he can explain why he's late, but Jessica tells him she doesn't care. He's here, and she loves him for it. The three girls all head out to find a place to eat, and Gwen happens to know the perfect place. It's back on Earth 65. That place is Clown Town, the greatest place on Earth, or any Earth for that matter. So Gwen asks Jessica how the whole being a mom thing is, and Jessica says honestly it's amazing when it's totally not exhausting and overwhelming. Gwen tells her, wow, don't sell me so hard on being a mommy, and then Cindy asks if anybody else wants to check out the ball pit. When everyone tells her no, Cindy jumps into the ball pit alone, and Gwen mentions that Cindy's not all there, is she? But Jessica tells her that Cindy was locked in a bunker for 10 years, and when she gets out, she finds out that her family has gone missing, and that's when Jessica asks, how is she? Gwen stays silent, and then she says her friend Harry, he kind of turned himself into the Green Goblin. Before long, Cindy joins the group again, asking if there's a Cindy on Earth-65. Because if there is, but Jessica stops her, telling her, that's not gonna happen, we came here for brunch and that's it. But since she still has some time, is there any non-us stuff in this world? The three of them leave and they decide to go to Starbucks to get some coffee before Cindy and Jessica have to go back to Marvel Prime. And just before Gwen Stacy can leave, someone's watching still. They report back that they found Gwen and that there are two other enhanced. And in response, whoever's in the other line of his call tells him they're sending in Project Green. As they're leaving, Jessica tells Gwen that Earth-65 was a cool call, coming here to hang out. And that's when the three of them hear a loud crash outside. Everyone heads over to a nearby rooftop to change, and Cindy asks if there's a giant robot, because she's totally dying to punch one! Jessica says that it's a super adaptoid. They're a bit tricky, so they need to, but Cindy jumps off the ledge, ready to go punch a giant robot. Jessica and Gwen follow after her, and Jessica shouts, Don't attack! The adaptoid will adapt to your powers! But Cindy happens to already be in the middle of shooting a web, as the adaptoid turns and covers her in web. Once Jessica frees her, she tells everyone that they need to attack at the same time, and above them, the man continues to watch. The man, however, that's watching is also in the building where everyone changed, and he decides to go through Gwen's bag and then leaves. Soon, the three girls attack once again, and with Cindy and Gwen holding it down with a web, Jessica jumps in, giving it a final blast. Afterwards, they look down as the cops begin to show up, and Gwen says that they should go. She's kind of wanted in this universe. But when Gwen goes back to her bag to get her dimensional travel watch, she notices it's gone. Elsewhere, the man from before delivers the watch to his boss, and his boss asks him, how does it work? The man tells her to just flip the switch and ta-da! Boss, meet Earth Prime. Earth Prime, meet Cindy Moon of Earth 65. Later that night on Earth-65, Gwen and Cindy bicker about how Gwen could have lost the teleporter. And as they go on, Gwen sees Jessica getting up to leave. She tells them that they have a choice. They can either stay here bickering or they can work as a team and get this done. Because if not, she's gonna find some real help or punch something so that she doesn't have to cave their heads in. Jessica leaps off the building and Gwen tells her that this is her world. They should follow her. With no real forms of communication, Jessica suggests that they all get some cell phones to keep in contact while they're stranded on Gwen Stacy's world. But as Jessica was in the process of commandeering some cell phones, everyone begins to hear someone else yell, Nobody move! The Bodega Bandit is back in business! Jessica asks, What the fuck?" And then zaps the man and drags him out of the store. As they leave, Cindy tells the store clerk that she knows things are a bit different, but do they happen to have a phone book she needs to look up an address? A little while later, while Cindy is changing out of her costume, Gwen says to Jessica that she can't believe that Cindy ditched them and she's not picking up her phone, and Jessica says she won't until she talks to them. But again, the two of them are being watched, and Gwen says that it's fine. Her spider sense is warning them of some peeping toms. As they head down to the Gwen's apartment, Jessica explains that Cindy's parents disappeared while she was exiled to that bunker. But for now, they're gonna have to deal with one thing at a time. Gwen opens up the door to her apartment, and then the music begins to blare out, and Jessica asks what the hell was that? One of the girls from inside says, that sister is rockin' effin' roll! Once inside, Jessica makes herself comfy on the couch inside of the mess, asking Gwen if this is really how she lives, and Gwen tells her, yeah, I guess. Seeing Gwen and her friends, Jessica says that there's a slight change in plans. She may not have really had a childhood, but she doesn't want to take Gwen away from the one that she has, so go to band practice, she'll find someone who can help them get back home. The next day, Jessica leaves to find the only person that can help, the Reed Richards of Earth-65. Jessica finds him and tells him that it's funny to see a kid skipping school to study. And he asks her if he's supposed to know her. And she says that she doesn't have the time or the energy to be Sarah Connor, but just know that she's a superhero from a different world. And Reed tells her, sure, I'll help you. She begins to say that she didn't even finish her sentence, but then she stops stating, he's Reed Richards. He was probably meeting dimensional hoppers before he could even tie his shoes. 
But before they can even leave, more men with spider masks begin to appear, and as Jessica jumps into action, one of the men shoots her with a taser. She begins to get back up, and a web flies through, grabbing one of the men, tossing them to the side. And Jessica asks, how did she find her? And Gwen says, she may have followed her. More men begin showing up, and the two of them begin fighting them off, but Reed mentions that she can shoot electricity, so... Gwen grabs Reed and jumps to the higher level of the monkey bars, and Jessica grabs down onto the level that she's on and shocks the floor, electrocuting all of the men climbing up after her. Once all of the men are knocked out, Jessica tells Gwen to get back, but Gwen tells her to stop saying that, like it or not, they're spider women, and that makes them family. As the night begins to arrive, Gwen takes Jessica and Reed to her father George Stacy's home to lay low. But as Gwen helps Reed, Jessica and George head over to the porch for a drink. And that's when Jessica's phone rings. Cindy's finally reporting in, stating that she's fine. But she called to warn her. It's not her that she should be worried about. So while Jessica and Gwen have found Reed and they're making their own plans to get back home, Cindy, on the other hand, ran off and she felt that she needed to find her parents in this world. And after a short while, she did. As she decided to talk to them, she found out that the Cindy of this world abandoned her family three years ago. Cindy tells them that she's sorry and she leaves, but as she does, her brother Albert follows her, telling her that he wanted to give her an invitation to his graduation party. She looks at the address, wondering how this world version of her could be such a jerk. And then she heads off to where the letter was supposed to go, the supposed apartment of Cindy Moon of Earth-65. She finds herself standing in front of a giant high-rise tower, but the strange part was that the butler in front welcomed her and says that he will get her to her private private elevator. Cindy thinks so the jerk version of her is wildly successful at who knows what, but it won't stop her from trashing the place. She walks around the fancy apartment looking at everything, wondering how it is in this world that she could cut her own family out of her life. Then she looks at herself in a mirror thinking, well, she did ditch Gwen and Jessica. And then the mirror changes, stating retinal scan complete. Suddenly, the sinks fly apart, and then a metal door begins to open up before her. Cindy thinks that there are only two types of people who have hidden elevators, pop stars, and supervillains. And then she enters the elevator, thinking, please be a pop star. She gets down to the ground floor, and judging by all of the monitors, she's decided that the Cindy Moon of Earth-65 is not a pop star, but she's an agent of Silk? She then hears a voice asking if she's back so soon. By the way, interesting new uniform. And as she can see, Project Jackhammer was a success. Oil has been spilled and stock has plummeted just as she projected. Cindy tells him, excellent. And then the man asks if there's been any word from Agent Drew. He would really prefer to not be in the dark regarding the interdimensional operations. Cindy begins to push the man away, telling him that she doesn't care what he prefers and if he'll excuse her. After locking herself away in her office, Cindy begins to look through the computer to try and figure out where Agent Drew is, and she finds where he lives, but not where he is. And then she mistakenly shuts down the entire system. However, there's one thing that she does find, and that's a USB drive labeled Spider Women. Back at George Stacy's home, Cindy calls Jessica to tell her what she's found, and she gives Jessica the address of this world's her, Agent Drew. Jessica tells her to try and get out of that secret enemy base quietly, and she's going to send Gwen Stacy over to help out. Gwen asks what is it she's going to do, and Jessica tells her, beat herself stupid. Back at Cindy's tower, the guards spot her and call her out for being the imposter, and they tell her to stop. Cindy begins to fight against the guards, but the man from before appears stating that he doesn't know who she really is, but then Cindy tells him that she didn't catch his name, or that squid friend of his either. And the man tells her, it's not a squid, she's an octopus. Elsewhere, in a short cab ride later, Jessica follows up on the address of Agent Drew. Normally, you wouldn't want to seek out your own doppelganger, but after Cindy found out that this world, Cindy Moon, runs an evil clandestine organization called Silk, and one of her main operatives in this world was herself, Jessica decided to seek out Agent Drew. She rings the doorbell and notices a woman answering the door, wondering if this is her, and then she realizes, no, stupid multiverse. The woman asks if she's looking for Jesse Drew, and Jessica tells her yes, and then the woman says that she is his wife. A little while later, Ellen lets Jessica in, stating that she never knew Jesse had a cousin that looked just like him. But as she goes to get them some creamer for their coffee, Jessica locks Ellen in the pantry. Now, with Ellen out of the way, it's time for Jessica to take a look around. Jessica begins to look through Jesse's study until suddenly she's knocked in the head with a can and Ellen tells her, how dare you? Jessica toss Ellen to the side, telling her to take it easy, that she really want to see what her husband's up to. And then she touches a globe on Jesse's desk and a recording states that the DNA scan is confirmed. The room begins to open up hidden compartments showing guns hanging up and Jessica says, see, he isn't what he seems. 
Ellen then grabs one of the guns from the racks and points it, stating she may not have known what her husband does, but she does know what he provides, and that's all that matters to her and her kids. Before the argument can continue, though, she hears Ellen's kids coming home from school asking if they can get a snack. Jessica and Ellen return to the living room and they try to act civil to not alarm the children. But as they leave, Jessica says that she's not here to mess with her family, but her husband is the reason why she's not home with her kid right now. He stole something from Jessica and that's why she's stuck here. 30 minutes later in front of Gwen Stacy's home, Jessica returns to find Gwen and Cindy already back from Cindy's little side trip. And Jessica says that there is no sign of the teleporter at Jesse Drew's home. However, before the conversation can really continue, a head peeks out from the door stating that it's ready. Once inside, Reed says that it works exactly like they wanted. It was sort of terrifyingly easy to build. Gwen mentions that this whole thing seems to be sketchy, but Jessica tells her that Reed is brilliant and an anal retentive person. He wouldn't send them if it wasn't safe. She begins to walk through the portal, assuming that she's gonna go home, and then she begins to scream out in pain, and then she pokes her head back to them, telling them, just kidding. Everything's good. The three of them cross over into the portal, and then Jessica hails down a cab and tells Cindy to take Gwen and find out what the evil Cindy has been doing. They're all gonna talk about it tomorrow. For now, she just wants to go home and see her baby. Cindy takes Gwen over to her office at the Fact News to learn that the evil her is stealing weapons from all of the superheroes in town. Cindy decides that she's gonna find a way to break the encryption on the USB drive that she stole from her other version's office and tell everyone what's going on, but when she gets to her computer, there's a message on her screen. Parker Industries, the Baxter Building, tonight. Love, Cindy65. Cindy says that it wasn't on the drive. She beat him here. The two of them head over to Parker Industries and they sneak in and Cindy says, don't worry, the remotes are turned off. And once they get inside, they're suddenly attacked by four giant robotic arms. The two of them begin to jump around having the arms follow and then they tie themselves into a knot. Gwen says, four down, now the other four. And then Cindy tells Gwen to look out as the arm reaches out to blast them. The two of them begin to get back up, but Cindy looks at the figure through the smoke and realizes that it's her. Well, the other her, Cindy 65. Cindy 65 gets a message back home informing her that her work is complete. And then Cindy Cindy jumps into attack. Just as Cindy is about to connect, a shield appears around 65 and she covers her whole body with it and then she blasts them just like Iron Man. Gwen tells her not to attack. She could have easily killed them before. She's just trying to show off what she could have been. So Cindy asks her, why all of this? Why bring Gwen into this? And 65 floats down telling her, because the Gwen Stacy of Earth 65, I'm basically her fairy godmother. Gwen asks her, what? And 65 says, maybe this is the time for one of those cliche supervillain speeches. A long time ago, Gwen saved 65's life like anyone else, until a spider came along one day in school, except it didn't bite her, it was killed. Ever since then, she's wondered, what if the spider bit her? Well, while working with S.H.I.E.L.D., another freak spider-related tragedy struck. But thanks to her research, Agent Drew managed to live, and he owed her just like Gwen owes her. So she decided to take the research that she came across and release it into the world in the form of a spider. Since then, she's been watching Gwen like a lab rat. And now with all of this world technology, she can ensure that no Cindy Moon ever has to hide in a bunker again. Gwen smacks her arm telling her, yeah, make a new world for her to sit on, right? And 65 tells her, she's offering them both a chance to have everything they've ever wanted, a chance to be all of the things that they should be. Cindy and Gwen tell her no way and they begin to charge in and 65 tells them, fine have it your way and then she blasts them away with her glove gwen starts to get back up and she says there's something wrong wait where's cindy 65 grabs her and points down telling them that the first thing that they stole was a pin particle you've heard of it right the thing that makes the ant men and wasps the size of actual ants and wasps it also makes women spider sized Small spiders begin to crawl out of 65's glove and they begin to cover Cindy and Gwen attacking them. 65 then says that since she made Gwen a superhero, she thought it would be fun to be the supervillain. And just as she gave, she can take away from Gwen. Gwen begins to black out as 65 leaves and after a while, Cindy begins to grow back to normal. When she goes to check on Gwen, she hears someone calling out to her telling her to stand down and she turns back to see Mockingbird telling her to stand down. The two girls are cuffed and taken away, and Cindy tries to say that it wasn't her who took all of those things, but Mockingbird tells her that she should have known better. She wasn't ready for this. The van begins to take them both away, and Gwen and Cindy stare at each other, with Cindy asking, what? Gwen tells her that she told her to call Jessica. They wouldn't be in this mess if they had just called Jessica. And she knows that she's been thinking about 65's offer as well. The two of them begin to bicker about it, and then Cindy's spider sense goes off as she asks Gwen if she can hear it. Outside of the truck, a missile flies through the air, hitting the truck, flipping it on its side. Gunfire starts to go off, and bullets begin to pierce the inside of the van, and they begin to see a hole being cut on the side of the van. 
As the side of the van falls out, they hear a voice telling them that their field trip has been canceled. There's still some recess, so let's play. And through the hole stands Black Cat holding a blowtorch. Gwen and Cindy escape and help Black Cat fight off the remaining guards. Gwen, now lacking her powers because 65 took them away, says, who needs her powers? She's fast, and then she gets hit in the back with a stun rod by a guard. Cindy helps her back up, and they continue on fighting, but as the last guard is knocked out, Black Cat says that it looks like her friend is leaving her behind, and Cindy tells her she's not her friend. Later that night, Black Cat takes Cindy to her roof and asks her, what have you gotten yourself into? Before she was holding back, but this new her, she likes it. Cindy tells her that she wasn't the one holding back. Now she needs help breaking into the Avengers vault. So Black Cat asks her, what are we waiting for? Let's go get what's ours. During all of this, Jessica returned home so she can finally see her son. And that's when she sees Roger and Jesse Drew. And Jesse is holding her son stating, what's up sis? Jesse tells her that he kept her son up way past his bedtime. So it's time for him to get some sleep. As Jesse goes to lay Jessica's son down, Roger mentions Jessica and Jesse Drew. That's wild. How could she never mention that she has a twin brother? And Jessica says she doesn't. But as Roger says try to explain it, Jessica sees Jesse hold out a gun behind Roger. Jessica plays along until Roger says he'll let them talk. He's sure they've got a lot of things to go over and he leaves. Jesse then says he had this whole stay out of his life and he'll burn hers to the ground thing planned. But after seeing this place, that threat would seem kind of hollow. Jessica runs up and punches Jesse and then begins to hit him again and again until he grabs her arm, tossing her off and blasting her. Jessica quickly jumps back up and grabs a hold of Jesse and slams him into the wall. But before she can jump on him and hit him, the two begin to hear the baby crying. She asks if he minds and he tells her, nah, go ahead. A little while later, after the baby goes back to sleep, Jesse says that he works very hard to keep his family safe. So how about they just stay in their own universes and not cross over? Jessica asks if she's supposed to forget about him working for an evil billionaire who stole Gwen's teleporter for God knows what. He then tells her, corporate espionage. Cindy came here to get the tech back home, reverse engineer it, and then sell it. Before long, Gwen knocks on the door, stating that she's sorry for barging in, and then she sees Jesse and jumps into attack. Jesse drops the teleporter and Gwen asks if she's punched him yet, which Jesse tells her, yes, they're past that part. Gwen says, good, then it's her turn and she cracks him again. But it wasn't Jesse's face that made that sound, it was Gwen's hand. Jessica asks, how did she break her hand hitting Jesse? And she tells him that his boss ambushed her and Cindy and stole her powers. And now she's all super powered or super science powered or something. Anyway, they plan to take it to their world and rule it. Jessica asks Jesse, corporate espionage? And Jesse shrugs, stating, that's what it's called. Jessica then asks how can he be okay with all of that and Gwen says it's because she has him under her thumb. She saved his life from some alien spider bite years ago and she's been giving him medicine to stay alive ever since then except she cured him 10 years ago. Gwen says she broke into that USB drive and it has files on Jesse Drew. The only thing that she's been giving him is for him to keep his powers. In fact, he can stop and just return to being normal at any time. Jesse then looks at the device on him and asks, this would make him normal again? No, he can't risk it. What about his family? But Jessica stops him, stating, she's not lying. We're superheroes, remember? Jesse finally agrees to help out, and then he tosses the device to Gwen, and Jessica snatches the item, telling her, before this, Gwen had a life. So before giving her back her powers, tell her that she wouldn't be better off without it, and she'll give it back to her. Gwen snatches the item, putting it on her arm, telling Jessica that that is her decision, not Jess's. Back over in Earth-65 at Jesse's home, 65 leaves the house stating that he's not here. He's dead to them. After all, she's done. She then turns and her glove switches to Hulkbuster mode and fires a blast, blowing up Jesse's entire house. After a helicopter comes back and picks her up, the neighbor across the street who was watching clicks his garage remote and begins to lift the garage. A van rolls out and Jesse calls to Jessica, telling her that his boss is definitely angry. She's going to throw a tantrum in private, so she should be on her way. Back over in 65's lab, 65 begins throwing fireballs, destroying things, cursing out Jesse. But as she goes to get something to eat, she hears Jessica's voice telling her that she must be sad that no one cared enough to build a bunker and put her away. So she just went ahead and built her own. 65 throws another fireball and Jessica runs in and knees her in the face. 65 gets back up and from her back out pops Doc Ox's mechanical arms. Off in the distance, Gwen is watching, waiting for her powers to come back. And Jessie says that she would know because she would feel really good once she got her powers back. But maybe it kicked in and she didn't notice. Gwen tries to lift up a motorcycle, but realizes, nope, she has no powers. And then Jessica comes crashing through the wall by one of 65's arms. Gwen asks if she's okay, and Jessica tells her to help as soon as her powers kick in before being dragged back out. Jessica begins fighting back, with 65 keeps changing through other heroes' abilities until finally she gets to Peter Putreski. 
Jessica falls back into the white goop and shouts, Paste Pot Pete? Seriously? Then she tells her, whatever works. And then the glove switches over to Victor Von Doom. Jessica's body is then shot across the lab, bouncing around until she is slammed into a wall, stopping her. And just before 65 can finish her off, she hears Gwen telling her that she better back up, Moon Pie, because Urban Assault Spider Gwen is about to battle damage her sorry butt. Gwen begins firing all of the guns at her, and as the smoke begins to clear, 65 stands there with a barrier from Captain America's shield. And then she says that it's time for Rhino Mode, as she starts charging in at Gwen. But then she stops when she hears the computer stating, Welcome, Miss Moon. Everyone looks back and sees Cindy with a suit of armor asking if she remembers that adaptoid that she sent after them. Well, she had little Reed Richards look into it and make some cool shape-shifting armor. Cindy jumps back in, catching 65 and slamming her back down to the ground, hitting her with Thor's hammer. Cindy then gets back up, ready to blast into her, but 65 tells her, United they stand. Nothing stands against Silk's adaptoid and spiders except EMP mode. Reed Richards. A giant blue blast goes off and Gwen looks at her gun stating, Crap! And Cindy just falls over. Without Cindy to help, 65 says, Guess they'll just have to fight hand to hand with no powers. And Gwen jumps in to punch, but her throw is rather weak. 65 tells her without her power, she can't even throw a real punch. And then she begins beating down Gwen. Punch after punch, Gwen is knocked down, but as 65 looks down on her, Gwen laughs stating, Dude, just said it would feel good when things kicked back in. She then kicks 65 up, hitting her into a wall, knocking her out. After freeing Cindy and Jessica waking back up, Jessica stumps on 65's glove and asks everyone if they want some aspirin and ice cream. Three weeks later, in Earth 65, the three girls go back for brunch again. And while eating, Jessica asks Cindy if she's going to go see her parents again. Cindy tells her no, just popping in wouldn't be fair to them. And then Gwen asks, speaking of, whatever happened to evil Cindy? So she says, funny you ask, we sent her a care package. Over in the Earth 65 Shield Correctional Facility, 65 opens up a box with some things like a VCR soda and reads a letter stating that she knows that she'll be locked up for a while. So, from one bunker to another. 65 kicks the box over and Jessica tells everyone, 20 bucks says that that's gonna come back and bite us in the butt. So there we were, Spider-Man and Spider-Woman kissing. Genki shouts, wait, 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 wait. How did this story go from looking for your missing dad to making out with Spider-Woman? Miles, Genki, and Fabio sit in their dorm room. Miles says that he figured that he would have wanted to know that part since he thinks that he's desperate for a girlfriend. Fabio tells him, we totally want to know that part. And Genki tells him, right, but what happened with your dad? So Miles tells him, fine, fine, let me start all over. That way you can hear the whole story of what happened, how me and Gwen Stacy of kissing. It all started one night when his mother called him frantic, asking if he had seen or heard from his father lately. Miles told her no, but in the back of his mind, Miles thought that maybe something could have happened to his dad if he had gone out looking for him since he was dealing with the superhero civil war. Miles began to try and think of who he could try to talk to to get some help, and that's when Maria Hill from S.H.I.E.L.D. showed up looking for him. Maria said that she needed his help, and it was about his dad. From what Maria explained, his father Jefferson had rejoined S.H.I.E.L.D. as an agent to try and protect Miles, but he's gone missing. Since Jefferson's face wouldn't have been known, she decided to set him up to take on a high-bid, high-stakes tech sale. Maria then holds out a small device stating that he was to intercept one of these things. It lets the user travel between realities and dimensions. The reason that she needs Miles' help is because, quite frankly, this setup wasn't even sanctioned and it's not on the books. Miles looks at Maria asking, why would that be? Maria explains that she may have inadvertently been the one responsible for getting the tech out there in the first place. So look. Before he gets all high and mighty, Miles stops her slapping the bracelet on stating, look, I don't care, just point me where to go. Maria goes on stating that their science division has picked up on energy signatures of where Jefferson probably fell into. So as the portal begins to open, Miles tells her, you know, I would like to know that you have more than a guess of where my father could be. And Maria tells him that you have your mission. Just do me a favor. If you see my other self and she's happily married, don't tell me about it. Miles jumps through the portal and in a flash, he's back in New York, the place that is his home. Except somehow it isn't. This is the alternate reality of New York. After swinging around a bit, Miles finds a gang hassling a woman. And even though he should be looking for his dad, he just can't stand for that. He drops down onto the store roof and he calls out to the men. And then suddenly he's hit by a giant ring. And the ring came from the woman? The ring starts shooting by and Miles thinks, great, that wasn't some old lady in distress. It was just this dimension's ringer. She's probably shaking them down. After jumping through another wave of rings, Miles webs up some of the pots and pans that the woman is standing by, and he pulls them down off of the shelf, crashing them down on top of her. Miles shouts, good, 
Now she can be quiet, and then a stray ring shoots back, hitting him in the back. He starts to pick himself back up, stating, well, that was stupid. And then another voice tells him, I'm not exactly sure what you're trying to do, but I am so not helping you clean that up. And that's what we see, Spider Gwen, AKA Spider Woman in this universe. But if you're looking for the comic book, she is Spider Gwen, an alternate reality version of Gwen Stacy that was bitten by the spider. And in this universe, she became the superhero. A short while later up on the rooftops, Gwen tells Miles that she's not sure why he keeps checking his phone. It's not like he's gonna get service over here. Miles sighs. <sighs> yeah, it's an old habit, but look, there's a reason why I'm here. It's about my father. He's gone missing. And Gwen asks, missing? Here? And Miles says, maybe? He was working for S.H.I.E.L.D., some super secret deal to protect my identity as Spider-Man. And they sent me on this mission and he just disappeared. I just keep checking my phone thinking maybe I would get a text or something. But I just can't stop thinking, what if my dad got into some trouble because he was trying to protect me? Miles gets back up telling her, I'm sorry to just throw it out there like that. I'm sure you have your own problems to deal with. I'll figure this out. I am Spider-Man. Gwen grabs him, telling him, look, don't be that way. It's okay to be freaked out. If anyone knows how that feels, it's me. My father is my whole world, and he put himself in a lot of danger for my sake. So even though we're spider folks, it doesn't mean that we don't get to be scared every once in a while. Gwen hugs Miles, and Miles' spider sense goes off, and Gwen says, You know, you can let me go now. When Miles looks back, he shouts, Holy crap, look at all the ninjas! And Gwen tells him to calm down, it's not what he thinks. Miles grabs Gwen and shoots a web shouting, Sure, but my spider sense is kind of going bonkers. So if you can tell me what this is all about when we're far, far away from the swords and shurikens, that would be great. As Miles swings off with Gwen, one of those shurikens is thrown cutting the web line. And Miles grabs onto the building shouting, See? They throw those silly things all willy-nilly! But as Miles looks back, he tells Gwen that he can't help but notice that she's falling and not catching herself. Gwen finally manages to shoot out a web line and she shouts, Look, stop, listen, I'm telling you it's okay. The man in red walks up telling Miles that his nose hasn't let him down yet. You stink of danger. Miles asks, who the heck is this guy and how does he know my freaking name? Gwen looks at the man in red and sighs, asking, What do you want, Murdoch? You could have just texted. And Miles says, wait, 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 Murdoch? As in Matt Murdoch? And Matt smiles, telling him, guilty as charged. But as Matt soon begins to walk off, telling Miles good luck, he's going to need it if he crosses his father's path, Miles grabs Matt, asking, wait, what did you say about my dad? And Matt quickly pulls out a blade, swiping at Miles. Matt tells him, sticky hands will get you stuck. And as Gwen sees the cut on Miles' arm, he says that he's fine. Gwen shouts, asking, what do you want? If you have information on his dad, just do us this one favor. Matt turns back laughing. <laughs> All of you superheroes in your bleeding hearts. Just know, Miles, that these radioactive isotopes are power-ups. It's a little secret on how Gwen keeps so spidery. But either way, I work for a woman named Cindy Moon, who is a despondent leader of the spy organization known as Silk. My job is to protect Cindy's interests in Silk, such as keeping away rats that would play while she's away. And your father, well, he's a playful rat. Matt pulls out an invitation to Club Scorpion and says that their mission is to find the man that has Jefferson's face and bring him here. Now, if you're wondering about the entire Cindy Moon and Matt Murdock and all that other kind of stuff, in this universe, Matt Murdock is a villain, although in the main universe, he is Daredevil. And Cindy Moon is also a villain, although in the main universe, she is the superhero known as Silk. We do have a story that kind of explains some of that, and I will link the Spider-Gwen storyline and the Spider-Women storyline down below so you can keep with the date. But let's go ahead and keep going. Later that night, Gwen heads into the club since Miles is only 16 and hands over the VIP pass to the bouncer. As she walks into the back, she begins to hear the sound of an auction. As she looks around, she notices a stash of superhero weapons, things that Cindy Moon has stolen. But S.H.I.E.L.D. should have impounded all of these things when Cindy was arrested, so why does she have it? However, before she can think about that, Gwen is smacked in the head with an octopus. Doc Ock shouts to Gwen asking if she takes them for buffoons! We are Silk, the veil that covers the world! From the shadows, someone else says, yeah, and your breath is intolerable. And then he punches Doc Ock. Miles pulls the octopus off of Gwen and shocks it. And Gwen asks, did you just kill it? And Miles says, no, it's a venom blast. I can do those. It's unconscious, I think. As Miles starts to fight off some of the thugs in the room, Gwen asks, when did you get an invisible camouflage predator thing? And Miles says, well, yeah, I have many powers as Spider-Man. And then someone walks up asking, Spider-Man, huh? Miles looks up to see his father, and Jefferson says, you're awfully scrawny to be any kind of a man. Miles shouts, dad! And Jefferson asks, what did you just say? Take off that mask. Jefferson pulls off Miles' masks, and he looks at him. Uh-huh. 
and then he punches him to the ground. As Jefferson reaches down and picks Miles back up, Gwen shouts, no, and she kicks him in the back of the head. Guards begin to rush into the room and Gwen starts to fight them all off. And just before hitting the last one, she asks, who's next? And the thug says that he would rather not if she doesn't mind. Gwen then jumps back to Jefferson and kicks him in the head again. But before she can pull her leg back, Jefferson grabs it and throws her. She catches herself stating, you're really fast. And then she jumps back down, hitting Jefferson, telling him, I'm faster though. Gwen puts her foot onto Jefferson's head, shouting, you're such a tool. And Jefferson pulls open his shirt and shocks Gwen with his chest plate, telling her, do not touch me. Miles starts to pick himself up and Gwen says, come on, we got stuff to do. As the two get back on their feet, Miles begins to fight off the guards while Gwen takes care of Jefferson. But as more guards come in, Gwen starts to focus on them, leaving Jefferson alone. Miles looks back to Jefferson asking, what are you? But before he can finish, Miles is blasted in the back. After being knocked through a wall, Miles groans, I'm outside now, aren't I? Miles then fires webs back into the club, tying Jefferson up, and then he hears the police shouting for him to put his hands up. He does what he's asked, and he tells them, I can explain this. Actually, now that I think about it, and then he fires webs into the air. As he starts to get away, Gwen punches Jefferson and throws him outside in front of the cops. She runs up the wall after Miles, telling him that the cops are here and the bad guys are got. It's time for us to go. Miles then gets back up, telling her, we can't, my father is down there. And as the cops take Jefferson away, Gwen says, look, this is perfect. While he's dealing with all of that, we can figure this whole thing out. And Miles walks off telling her, no, I'm gonna go help him out. So Gwen fires a web at him telling him to get back. Miles jumps to dodge it and he turns back telling her, that was not cool. And then Gwen sprays him with more web. Gwen walks up and hugs him telling him, look, the bad guy is caught, that's a good thing. We will figure out this whole thing. But in the meantime, can we just calm down and focus? And as she finishes saying that, two officers run onto the roof shouting for the both of them to freeze. Gwen reaches over and pushes the button on Miles' transporter and he asks, what are you doing? She tells him, saving them, again. And the two fade into a purple light. And just as the two reappear, Apocalypse rides up on a giant spider shouting, kill them for your master, Apocalypse. Gwen pushes the button again stating, I hate it when that happens. And they reappear again in Gwen's world. And Miles says, that man, he looked and sounded just like my father. Gwen says, don't worry, we're gonna figure it out. And then the transporter dings. Miles asks, what is it doing? And Gwen tells him that she's not sure. Hers never did anything like that. Miles then reads, return to origin point. And Gwen says, maybe they found his dad back on earth. Right, I should go, right? And Gwen tells him that she'll come too. They're in this together now. Miles tells her thank you. She pushes down on the button again, stating that he would do the same for her. As the two fall out of the portal, Gwen lands on her butt, shouting, boots on the ground, not butts. And Miles says, let's just hope we're back in my world. And the transporter dings, stating that he's arrived at Earth 616. Realignment mode initiating. Please wait for further instructions. Miles asks, what kind of instructions are those? And Gwen says that she's not sure her teleporter watch never talked to her. She then looks up seeing a group of men webbed up and says that she's pretty sure they're exactly where they need to be. Miles plucks a small device from one of the men's heads and a small image of Peter Parker Spider-Man appears stating, hello citizen, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man here. For your safety, please wait for the authorities to arrive. Gwen rips open a box stating, so silk agents are on this earth working for your evil dad. And Miles shouts, hey, that creep is not my dad. But what are they doing here? Stealing more weapons? She pulls an item out of the box that was with the thugs, stating that they are stealing batteries? Really? This is gonna be the worst team up ever. Miles looks over at one of the men and tells him that he needs to explain what's going on. And the man laughs, telling him, ha ha, no way. The Scorpion sounds like a name of a man who would be big on forgiveness. The transporter begins to ding again and it says, interdimensional web access detected. Multiple gateways unlocked. And then in a flash, the group of thugs vanish. Gwen grabs Miles by the hand and tells him, look, we need to get out of here before the cops come and get to work figuring this whole thing out. And a short while later, on top of a building, Gwen examines the battery, saying that she knows that she vetoed the cops, but they do need some help here. Miles shouts, no, we can't let the adults in on this. They're just gonna end up punching each other. Or maybe one of them. Gwen then says they have all the dots that just need to connect them. Silk duplicated the gateway that they stole from her. And even with Cindy 65 in prison, they're still hopping over here to steal more super weapons. If they're selling this stuff to the highest bidder, why would they need more money? And Gwen shouts, wait, that's gotta be it. So Miles asks, is this the part where we blurt out the answer at the same time? Cause I got nothing. She goes on telling him that the watch is interdimensional. My Reed Richards built it. And if there's only one of him, then it would be really hard and costly for the run of the mill mad scientist to do it. Miles asks, 
So does that mean that the stolen Earth 616 tech that Silk is selling is to pay for something like this? That's not good. Gwen tells him, nope. And if the Silk agents disappearing are any indication, they might not need the watches anymore. They just figured out how to zap anywhere. Miles gets up telling her, look, before this thing gets even crazier, I would like to say that I really appreciate you coming along. But before he can continue, there's suddenly a eek. Oh no. And Gwen asks, did you just hear an eek? Miles ducks behind the AC unit and says, oh God, she saw me. And Kamala Khan towers over the two of them saying, hi. And then she shrinks down telling Miles that the champions were getting worried when he wasn't responding. Is something wrong? Kamala looks at Gwen and says, I'm not interrupting something that I shouldn't have. And Miles shouts, no, 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 it's just a team up, a harmless old spider team up. Gwen says that they could use the help if she's here. He did say no adults, right? So Miss Marvel's fine. And as Gwen and Kamala begin to head off, Miles rubs his face stating, oh God. A short while later at another warehouse of batteries, Gwen and Kamala wait for Miles to catch up. And Kamala says that she, uh, saw how they were before she came, so she wasn't. And Gwen sighs, oh God. And Kamala says that she's just saying she seems well-intentioned and all, but Miles is the best. Just don't hurt him. Miles jumps down and Gwen shouts asking, what took so long? Miles and Gwen hurry inside and see a group of silk agents. And one of the agents shouts, where the hell is Gary? We only went like 20 feet. The other shouts back, I forgot the decimal point, Randy, gee, sue me. Seconds later, Kamala jumps in, swatting away the agents, shouting, that's them, right? And one of the agents steps back up to the portal. Miles then hands Gwen his transporter and says that they're about to jump, he's going with them. Gwen tells him, no, they could be going anywhere, so Miles jumps in, tackling the agent, and in a flash, they're gone. Kamala asks, what just happened? And Gwen looks at the transporter, stating that they could have gone anywhere. And the watch responds, gateway opening, please stand clear. And that's when another portal opens. Gwen walks towards it and Kamala shouts, wait, I can't just let you go. And Gwen stops her telling her that she has to stay. Her and Miles get into this mess together and together is the only way that they're gonna get out of it. Back over on Earth 65, Miles and the thug fall out of the portal as Miles shouts, ow, you okay, man? And the thug shouts, no. And the scorpion looks back shouting, you. And Miles says, well, Mr. Scorpion, Jefferson, Jeff, Jeffrey, whatever they call you in this dimension, we need to talk. Scorpion then tells the rest of his men to stand back. He's taking care of this one himself, and Miles sighs. Oh, come on. Just as the Scorpion gets close, there's another flash of purple light, and Gwen jumps out of the portal, kicking Scorpion in the face, shouting, thank you, ding. As Miles starts to web up Scorpion, he says, right, sure, now the watch dings. The guards from before start shooting and Scorpion screams for them to stop, but as they do, they miss and hit the dimensional vortex. The men start getting sucked into the dimensional vortex and Miles shouts, don't worry, I'm okay, kind of. Miles then reaches out to Gwen, but before grabbing her hand, the portal starts to pull her in and she's flung through the dimensional vortex. It was at that moment that Miles figured out that this was going to be it, and then he let go to get pulled in with her. A few seconds later, Miles falls out of the portal and as Gwen dusts herself off, she says that she really thought that they were donezo back there. Gwen then hugs Miles asking where they are and Miles has no clue. And then there's a big giant blimp floating by. It's just then that a voice calls out to them and a man dressed in black shouts at them. As Miles responds to him, Gwen says that it's probably not a good idea to talk to strangers living in shadows. However, the watch begins to malfunction and another portal opens up around them and Miles shouts, I'm really not loving this anymore. The transporter begins throwing the two of them into different dimensions until it finally stops. And Gwen asks, where are we now? As a horde of undead zombies begin to shuffle their way, Gwen says that she would very much like to leave now. After another jump, Gwen catches herself on a wall and sees Miles is nowhere in sight. She then jumps up and looks at a billboard with a picture of her and Miles married. And a note stating, happy anniversary to the amazing Spider-Man and spectacular Spider-Woman on their 20 years of bliss. She stares and asks, uh, what? and the transporter dings. Meanwhile, with Miles, he falls out of the portal, catching himself, and then he hears something moving in the background. He leaps at the sound and he sees Scorpion and punches him into the rubble. Miles picks himself back up again to get hit, and the Scorpion tells him, wait, 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 don't hit me. And then he smiles, telling him, that really hurt. And Miles stares and asks, dad? Over on Earth 8, Peter Porker wakes up to the sounds of Max and Charlotte arguing over who's going to see the last Pop-Tart and sighs, telling him, Great, another week of babysitting this. There isn't enough coffee in the... And then he stopped and he hears a knock at the window. Peter looks over to see Gwen knocking and he tells the kids, Look, a time displaced version of your mother is home. Again. Meanwhile, over on Earth 65, Miles says, Wait, is it really you? And Jefferson says that he could have asked that before punching. I'm sorry, there's just some evil jerk with your face, and when I see evil, I punch it. Jefferson hugs his son, telling him, Good man, now we got some work to do. 
Silk is dangerously close to mastering interdimensional transportation, and Scorpion is holding the multiverse hostage. Miles puts back on his mask, telling him, All right, Butch and Sundance then? And as the two walk into the portal, Jefferson says, You know they were outlaws, right? Back on Earth 8, Gwen looks at Peter Porker and says, It's just you. Sorry, I get hit in the head a lot, and sometimes I just see things. Porker tells her, Yes, well, I'm Peter Porker, Sportorcular Spider-Ham of Earth-8, and our scans say that you're from Earth-65's timeline, so you're obviously another... Charlotte shouts out, Another Spider-Gwen! It's totally amazing! And Gwen asks, What does she mean by another? Max munches on his Groot loop, saying, Besides our mom? Multiverse, duh! Peter Porker then heads over to the computer and begins telling it that he needs access to Earth-65. Another stray Gwen needs to get home ASAP. A portal begins to open up, and Gwen asks, What, already? And Peter tells her, Well, yeah, this ain't a bed and breakfast. Got a utopia to run. Gwen begins to say that she can't yet. She needs help. Her and Miles are battling an evil version of his dad, and Porker stops her and says, What? You really need my help? Yeah, sorry. Spider Computer says no. You should know better than anyone how hard it is to clean up parts of the multiverse. There's plenty of help out there, but you really need to leave. Gwen shouts, Wait, look! Most days I'd wish that I'd never seen those stupid portals. Never dealt with the gothy space vampires, evil doppelgangers, or clones. All those stupid clones! And Porkers tells her, Look, Gwen Stacy's and their dopey species don't get to me. I know what really is going on. We all went through the same thing. Might look all bright here, but you have no clue what Miles and Gwen sacrificed to get us here. I'm sorry, but our fight is done. Gwen looks back at the portal, telling him, Man, that's a first that the speech didn't pluck at a single heartstring. But before Gwen walks in, Charlotte grabs her arm, telling her, Wait, we can't let you do this. Please, Uncle Ham, we are the Spider family. Peter mumbles to himself, Ugh, oh, stupid dopey speeches. Back over at Earth-65, Miles and Jefferson fight off Scorpion's men, and Scorpion shouts, But that is the last freaking straw! I'm gonna rip your face off and wear it like a mask! I'm gonna strangle every single version of the Morales family in their cribs! And when Gwen's voice tells him, That's pretty elaborate. She then jumps through a portal, kicking Scorpion, telling Miles to hurry up and smash the watch. Miles rips it apart, and Scorpion gets back up, shouting, You are far too late! I've already got what I need. A group of Scorpion's men then run through a portal, but as they get through, they see Peter Porker. And one of the men then starts singing, Spider Pig, Spider Pig, and Peter Porker shouts, Why does everyone say that? Ah, oh, it's ham! Spider ham! It's a play on words! It's really obvious! Another man tells Peter Porker that he should probably run along before they huff and puff, and Peter Porker starts hitting his transporter, telling them, Man, three little pigs jokes? Well, you can get all big and bad, right, Penny? Miles watches as more spider people come out of the portal, one being a giant giant robot, and he asks, what is that? And Gwen tells him, you won't believe it, but that's a brighter tomorrow. As the spider people start fighting everyone, one of the spider girls wraps and throws Scorpion, shouting, hey dad, catch! Miles shouts, me? And Jefferson tells him to just get behind him, and he opens up a portal. Scorpion flies through, and Miles asks, where does that go? And Jefferson tells him, don't worry, the Scorpion of Earth 65 will be just fine. Scorpion falls out of the portal and a light shines on him as another Jefferson in a suit of armor tells him, I hope you're not looking for trouble, because Arbiter Rio is law. As the Spider family finishes up, Miles asks Gwen about those bouncy kids. They were really there? And Gwen tells him, yep, well, possibly. On Earth 8, anyways. The one on the motorcycle with spider him is Jessica's kid, Jerry. The girl in the fur, and Miles says that that was totally craven. Miles puts his forehead on Gwen and says that he barely knows where to... Where do they go from here? Gwen grabs Miles and kisses him pushes him back into the portal, telling him, I'm sorry, that was, well, it was good, but timing, no. All of that looked nice, but she really doesn't want to feel like she doesn't have a say in what's coming. And later, as Miles and Gwen sit on a rooftop, Miles says, yeah, I don't need any more expectations or responsibilities. How about friends? Gwen tells him, yeah, just friends, for now. Late night in the New York convenience store, Dollar Dog, a man tells the cashier that he knows the drill. Your corn dogs are your life! The cashier sighs, stating it's the Bodega Bandit. You're just the worst! The Bodega Bandit sets down his dog, Bandito, and he tells him to go outside and make sure the coast is clear. Bandito trots outside, and he gets to eat in his corn dog. But waiting in the sewers, a giant lizard crawls out, hissing at Bandito. The next morning, Gwen Stacy wakes up in her apartment and quickly realizes something. She just overslept for her first day in her new job. As Gwen suits up in her Spider Woman suit, she runs out, jumping from building to building, asking why. Why of all days do her web shooters decide not to work? It's only been a month since she used them. Miss Van Dyne never said anything about having to clean them. And after a short hop through traffic, Gwen makes her way into the alleyway, getting into her work clothes, stating, Okay, Circus Lion ate my Metro Pass? Hobo stole my bike? However, as Gwen turns the corner, she sees her boss, 
Albie sitting outside of the Dollar Dog asking what happened. Albie tells her that it's over. Ruined, kaput! This world has spider woman, vultures, and giant lizard men. The police think that he's crazy! Even the insurance agent laughed. Gwen looks around to see the Dollar Dog destroyed with everything scattered about and says, Well, did you say giant lizard? And Albie shouts, It ain't everything! Later that night, Gwen tracks down the only man who could have seen anything, the Bodega Bandit. As she sits on top of a dumpster, she asks, Really? I just want to ask a few questions. And the voice from inside the dumpster yells, Go away! Gwen rips off the top of the dumpster, telling him, All right, look. If I really wanted to bust you, I would have just carried this whole thing to the precinct. You really are the worst! She looks inside and sees the Bodega Bandit laying in the trash, asking him, Are you crying? Bodega Bandit holds up Bandito's collar, telling her to just go away. He doesn't want to talk about it! A short while later, Gwen heads over to the Midtown High School, stating that it's impossible. It doesn't matter what Albie or the Bodega Bandit saw. There's no way the lizard is on the loose. No one knows that Peter Parker is actually the lizard. Well, almost no one. She starts to go through Kurt Connors' computers, looking for information, and when she finds his profile, the information on his home phone and address is restricted. She grabs the computer monitor and throws it out the window, screaming, He lied! Connors lied, and she fell for it, and now he's disappeared. Gwen begins to think back to prom night, the night that everything changed. The night that Peter changed. He was shouting traitor, and when she stepped in to stop him, he told her that he wanted to be just like her, special. Later, Gwen heads down into the sewers with a backpack full of corn dogs, tossing them out, yelling, Here, Lizzie, Lizzie, Lizzie! As she stops for a moment, she thinks maybe she should tell her dad the truth about Peter. She wouldn't tell May and Ben about it, but maybe she can talk to her own father. Just then, she looks over at the tunnel and sees several sets of eyes staring back at her. And before she can ask, what is that? A pack of dogs and cats stampede by, taking the corn dogs. She shouts, hey, get back here with the bait. And as Gwen gets up to chase after them, there's a hissing sound coming out of the tunnel and a larger pair of eyes looks out. Suddenly, a giant lizard man jumps out of the shadows and starts to eat away at her back. Gwen gets up asking, how could you, Connors? How could you betray Peter's memory? What have you done? But then more lizard men charge out of the tunnel, all swiping at Gwen. She falls to her knees thinking, no, this is just a nightmare. Peter was my friend. Whatever he's become, it wasn't this or can it? And just then a red, white, and blue blur shoots by hitting the lizard men. And Captain America tells Gwen, enough of this. These men are property of S.H.I.E.L.D. now. And as for you, Spider-Woman, you're under arrest. Gwen starts to get back up, stating, Aw, come on! Please don't tell me you hate me too. You're my dad's favorite. Cap says that she has to the count of three to surrender. And Gwen tells her, Wait, I didn't do any of that stuff that the police or Jameson said. I also don't know where all of these... But before she could finish, the Lizardmen begin to attack her again, and Cap begins to count down. Once Cap reaches three, she throws her shield, bouncing it off of the Lizardmen and barely missing Gwen. As the shield continues to ricochet off the walls, Cap starts to swing at Gwen and then lands a hard hit into Gwen's face. A short while later, Gwen begins to open up her eyes, and Cap tells her, Come on, on your feet, soldier. I have some questions for you. Gwen leans up, fidgeting around, asking if she's for real right now. Last time she had a head injury, she spent all day arguing with a talking pig. She tries to pull her arms forward, telling her, Wait, handcuffs? And Cap tells her, don't even bother. These cuffs are vibranium. The only way out is the truth. She can begin by telling her why she was down here in the sewers to begin with and what her connection to Silk is and who is Dr. Kirk Connors. Gwen looks over and sees Connors beginning to change back into a human and asks, Whoa, 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 you cured him? And Cap says, No, what they have is a suppressant. Once the lizard mutagen bonds, there is no cure. Gwen shouts that there has to be these monsters that can't, this, this can't be Peter's legacy. And who the hell is Silk? Whatever you think you know, Peter's the one who created the lizard. We were alone when he changed back. Connor hears Gwen say Peter, and then he starts to shout, Peter, Parker, I remember Parker. As Connors begins to stand back up, Cap holds up her shield, telling Gwen to get behind her. And Connor screams, What happened to Peter? Connors lunges at Cap, cutting into her stomach, and Gwen yells to him that he needs to stop and take control. When Connors turns to her, Gwen webs Cap's shield, swinging it back around, cracking Connors across the face. Connor shouts again, calling out for Peter, and as he jumps at Gwen, she holds up the shield, knocking him to the ground. She then holds the shield out to hit Connors again, but before she can, she sees an image of Peter during his change and him stating that he wanted to be just like her, a hero, someone with powers. She drops the shield, stating, no, please, no. Connors gets back up and then suddenly is shot several times in the back. 
both Gwen and Connors look back and they see Detective Jean DeWolf and Gwen asks, what is she doing here? Jean tells her to stand down and as she turns to fire again, Gwen yells for her to stop. Jean then turns firing into Connor's chest, but then Falcon's Red Wing flies by cutting through Connor's chest, knocking him away. Red Wing starts to peck at Connor's and Cap gets back up holding her stomach, telling Gwen that this op is scrapped, time to leave. Gwen yells, no, I won't let that thing get away and hurt anyone else. And Cap tells her that she cannot fight this. She is way out of her weight class. Gwen holds both of her wrists together, telling her, no, I don't work for you. I'm here to help people. Gwen then shoots her webs to the ceiling above Connor's and begins to pull it back down. As Gwen struggles trying to bring the roof down, Cap grabs onto the web, stating, damn it, spider woman, put your back into it. The two begin to feel the ceiling give, and a second later, the rubble and debris come down, trapping Kirk Connors. A short while later, Falcon walks through asking Cap, what is she now? Some hippie who lets fugitives escape? Cap lets out a low laugh, telling him that there's a chain of command for those kinds of answers. The more pressing question here is, why did you let Detective DeWolf down here? Falcon tells her, hey, don't look at me. Director Peggy gave the okay. Jean then says that like she already told her boss, what they found here is a direct link to the case that she's working on. So maybe they can help each other get a clue. Dr. Connors has been missing since this whole mess started. And now Spider Woman is here. And from the looks of it, they just found smashed together the world's ugliest peanut butter cup. Cap tells her, no, I'm afraid that that doesn't seem likely. Connors and these men are not the Midtown High Lizard. They're just copycats. Connors and all of these men are lab rats, weapons built by a shadow cell that we know is Silk. Based on Spider-Woman's reaction here, I'd say that if you want to find the truth out about Lizard, then you're going to need to look into the dead Parker boy. Meanwhile, over at the Stacy household, there's a knock on the door and Matt Murdock asks, what? Not gonna let me in? Gwen's father, George, opens the door telling him that he knows that he may not be able to see his face, but if he doesn't get off his porch in the next 30 seconds. Matt tells him, whoa, 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 whoa. I could see that someone peed in your cereal this morning. If you're not careful. There might be trouble for you and your daughter. George steps out asking him, what did you say about Gwen? And Matt goes on telling him that most people would say that you're a lucky man to have been saved by Spider-Woman twice. Even a blind man can see that there's more to it than that. I'm here to help you and your daughter. We know who you are and just what you can do. Matt hands George his business card and he turns to leave telling him that if you ever need to make your own luck, call me. Back with Gwen, she heads out to the cabin with her friends and she's supposed to be staying the night when she shows up late. She walks to the door and her friend Randy tells her that she shouldn't go in yet. Everyone is out right now and this took him forever to set up. Gwen asks, what is he even talking about? And Randy says that after all these years that they've come out here, he's finally arrived. And Gwen says, wait, you don't mean. And as the door opens, Harry Osborne says, yeah, pretty sure he meant me. Takes a few moments, but Gwen says that it's been two years, two years since they've seen him or heard from Harry. Harry begins to try and explain and Gwen hugs him, telling him to just shut up. Later, as all the girls come back, everyone sits around the bonfire laughing and talking, but Gwen doesn't feel as happy as she should. Back in school, Peter, Harry, and her, they were inseparable. She should be happy, but no one's heard from Harry since Peter's funeral. He was the one who took it the hardest, which is why she never went looking. She always hoped that maybe he was off traveling and Peter's death convinced him to live his own life. While everyone jokes and laughs, Gwen gets up and leaves, and Harry runs after asking her what's wrong. She hasn't said anything to him all night, and Gwen tells him that it's not anything like that. She just has had a long day, and she needs to get some rest. They can catch up tomorrow morning. Harry stops her, telling her that he won't be here in the morning. He only came here tonight to see her. All of these other girls, they're her friends, her, Peter, and him. That was the stuff that he cared about. She saw what Peter became. The shadow of it all fell on everything. And he couldn't just stay there and do nothing. Again, Gwen asks, what does he mean again? Where did he go? Harry says that he's the one who caused all of this. Peter died because of him. Back then when Peter changed, he said that he was trying to. Actually, I'm not sure what he thought. But whatever came over him, he grabbed me shouting traitor. Gwen tells him, look, whatever Peter said or did, it wasn't him. That wasn't who Peter really was. There were years of feeling helpless and years of bottled up feelings. It was all the lizard talking. There's no way that he could have. Harry sighs, telling him, I saw it all. I just stood there and watched Peter die. Spider Woman was there gloating. I asked her to stop, but Spider Woman just toyed with me. Peter worshiped her she broke his heart. Gwen says, but Peter was out of control. Spider-Woman was trying to help. She didn't know that it was Peter. Harry stops her telling, yeah, but I knew. I knew and I didn't say anything to try and stop it. I just stood there, frozen like a coward. For two years, I've lived knowing that I could have done something. I swore that I would make it up to Peter and never freeze again. Harry takes out a small device, pressing a button, and he continues talking. I went to war. The army taught me how to fight, and S.H.I.E.L.D. taught me how to kill. A goblin glider flies down, and Harry says, Whatever happens next to me, just know I did it for Peter. I did it for us. Harry jumps onto the glider, and Gwen says, Where are you going? And Harry tells her, She's still out there. 
Peter's killer is still on the loose, and I'm going to be the one who stops her. I'm the only one who can bring Spider-Woman to justice. Flash forward a few nights and Gwen finds herself jumping from rooftop to rooftop in the rain trying to avoid a goblin drone that is chasing her. She ducks behind a wall stating that she knew this was going to happen. She knew they were going to hunt her and that they would catch up. She's sick of feeling like a coward, tired of hiding in the dark. The shadows can pretend, but she's not like them. She catches her breath and gets back up stating, enough, enough of this! If they want to arrest me for what happened to Peter Parker, fine, I'll go peacefully. But they're going to have to come down here first and hear my side of it. The drone laughs, asking, <laughs> Arrest? No. Who said anything about arresting? Just then, two blades shoot out of the glider and they whiz by, cutting into her arms. More blades begin to fly by and Gwen starts to put her hands together to create a thick ball of webbing. She then grabs a hold of one of the spinning blades, whipping it around at the drone, cutting it into the drone's chest. It explodes, knocking Gwen to the ground, and as she gets back up, Harry himself, the Green Goblin, flies down right in front of her. She grabs her arm, calling out to Harry, stating that she knows who he is. She knows that he was there when his friend died. But she wants him to know that she did not know he was the one inside of it. She was afraid that if she couldn't stop him, if she didn't push so hard, Harry shouts, LIAR! He begged you to stop, and yet you toyed with him and laughed at his pain! Gwen tries to say something, but in the back of her mind, she's screaming at herself to just tell him, pull off the mask, tell him that she is Gwen Stacy! He would understand. Gwen then says that she knows what he's going through. She lives through it also. She knows the weight of not being able to stop something, but she can swear to him that none of this is his fault. Harry asks, is that your side? This is your case? These are the words that you think would make me forget? Just then more of the goblin drones fly by chasing after Gwen, forcing her to retreat. As she swings, she tells herself that whatever she'll put him through is not the same Harry Osborne behind that mask. One of the drones rockets by, grabbing Gwen by the throat, and as it squeezes, it starts to fly all around, not killing her. She begins to try and fight back, and they end up flying into a building under construction, with her stating that he's just toying with her, taking his sweet time, drawing it out like she did with the lizard. She manages to hit the drone, and it explodes, throwing her back down to the ground, and another drone jumps down and begins to walk. Gwen gets up and webs a cement tray, and flips it up and onto the drone. With the drone slowed down, she grabs a hammer and knocks its head off. She says that she really hates to go all red carpet fashion blogger on about what is all of this. Flying hoverboard, Middle Earth Power Ranger thing, it's all a bit too much. Harry flies down asking her, is that all you do? Talk! And Gwen tells him it's better than standing on the sidelines and acting like you're in the game. Harry pauses and says, actually you're right. I can power down all the drones and then we can take a more hands-on approach. He pulls out another small device and he hits a button and a beam shoots out to form a sword. He charges forward, swinging it wildly, but Gwen ducks and grabs him from behind, throwing him up onto the second floor. She then jumps up, webbing Harry's helmet, telling him that all he needs to do is talk to her. They can end this right now. He gets back up, recklessly swinging the sword again, and Gwen pulls back on his helmet, pulling it off, shouting, just stop and talk to me! This isn't what Peter would have wanted, you have to know that! And Harry tells her, yeah, just keep talking like you know me. There are things that I've done to get here, and you have no idea what I'm capable of. Gwen begins to hear a ticking by her feet, and when she looks down, she sees a pumpkin bomb, and it explodes, throwing her body through a wall. Harry begins to walk forward, taking off his armor, telling her that she's right. Peter wouldn't have wanted this. Peter idolized her and wanted nothing more than to be like her. That hope drove him to create this, the lizard mutagen. Harry holds up a small green vial. And Gwen tells him to wait as he holds it up, drinking it. He falls to his knees, hunched over in pain, with Gwen running over, asking why would he do that, and he smacks her away, stating that the lizard was his science fair project. Before Peter, it was the experiment that cost Connors his job at Oscorp, a riddle with no solution. When he approached his father to help in recreating Peter's experiment, he thought he was crazy, and he was right. Harry grabs Gwen by the head and pulls her close, telling her that it wasn't until his work with S.H.I.E.L.D. that he was brought to Silk. They jumped at a chance to recreate Peter's work. And along with S.H.I.E.L.D.'s own wounded soldiers, Connors became a lab rat. Silk released the lizards to test them in the field, and S.H.I.E.L.D. delivered the results to his desk. Gwen coughs as she tries to state that he saw what happened to Peter when he took the formula. There's no way that he can! 
And Harry shouts, I can't! I can control it! I am in control! Harry throws Gwen into the wall, and as she begins to pass out, Harry stands over her with a knife, stating that he will defeat her just with Peter's will. He'll be Peter's greatest idea come to life, his justice, his hand striking out from beyond the grave. Harry then reaches down, grabbing the mask and pulling, and Gwen looks up at him, telling him, Stop! It's me! It's Gwen! Harry frowns when he sees Gwen without her mask, and he says, No! You can't be! No! No! Elsewhere in the city, George Stacy steps out onto a roof and Matt Murdock calls back that he wasn't so sure he was going to call. He has questions, just fire away. Wait, scratch that, poor choice of words. George tells him that's enough. He's here because he offered to help his family to protect his family from Frank Castle's investigation. Why? Why the hell would he ever trust the new kingpin of crime? Matt points to his shirt stating, Kingpin? Moi? Captain, I'm just a blind servant of justice. Why, I can't even dress myself. George grabs Matt by the shirt, telling him, Don't you dare play dumb. My daughter's life isn't currency in your stupid game. Matt swings his cane, knocking George back, asking, Feeling helpless and threatened? Good. Now you know how the rest of them feel. I may not have cameras and wiretaps, but that doesn't mean I'm not watching. It doesn't take a genius to figure it all out. Hell, Castle did. I know your daughter's secret. I know that Gwen Stacy is Spider-Woman. That much was suspected after you were saved not once, but twice, Mr. Stacy. George gets back up, telling him that he still doesn't know why he would help. And Matt says, Come on! Who hates the police more than me? Who else has any hope of stopping me? Who else can? And George stops him, stating that he wants Gwen as a foot soldier. Matt laughs, stating, Gwen is out there risking her neck all the time because you drilled your stupid dad cop nonsense into her skull. The spider that bit Gwen didn't make her spider woman, you did. Some of Matt's ninjas jump down and George reaches for his gun stating, I knew this was a setup. And Matt using his cane holds George's arm telling him, easy there. If I wanted you dead, that would have happened a long time ago. Matt throws his arm around George telling him, we're here for you, but not you in a manner of speaking. We aren't here to kill you. Matt has George look over the ledge and he sees Frank drinking next to his car. And George tells him, you can't kill Frank Castle. Matt laughs, telling him, that's where you're wrong. You're the only one who can. As the ninjas jump down and they begin to attack Frank, Matt says that Frank's life is in his hands. He can live or die if he wishes. George grabs Matt, telling him, you would never. I refuse to be a part of. But Matt grabs George, pinning him, telling him, Frank is nothing to me or my business. You can do the right thing. Be the man that protects your family. Open Schrodinger's box. Does Frank Castle live or die? George punches back on Matt, telling him no. Gwen would never join him for doing something like that. You're betting this all on a gamble. If you were going to kill Castle, that would mean that you'd be showing your cards. In turn, showing your true face. Matt breaks away laughing. <laughs> and just as one of his ninjas gets ready to strike down on Frank, Matt snaps his fingers. And Matt tells him, well played. You've got your wish. Nothing will happen to Frank Castle. George grabs his gun and he begins to fire, but Matt disappears in a puff of smoke. Back with Gwen and Harry. Captain America stands outside with Dollar Dog, asking, Are you sure that they're both in there? Peggy radios, Wait! Don't you dare go in there! And Cap tells her that she saw it in Spider-Woman's eyes back in the tunnel. Whatever she's got going on, it's driving her to get things right. It's up to her to make sure that she has a chance. Cap follows the hissing sound and Harry shouts, LIES! EVERYONE LIES TO ME! NO MORE LIES! Cap holds up her shield, telling Harry, All right, son, come and get some truth then. Gwen begins to blink and her vision comes into focus and she sees Cap moving in on Harry and tells Harry no. Cap runs into Harry with her shield, lifting him up, pinning him into a wall, asking, Is this what you want? Revenge? Redemption? Cap reaches into her pocket, pulling out a syringe of suppressant, stating, Whatever it is, it's over now. This is what my daddy used to call a coming to Jesus moment. Harry reaches out, grabbing Cap by the arm, stating that he will not let her take this chance away. I'm still in control. Just then, Harry's glider actually activates its defense mode, and it begins to shoot out more pumpkin bombs. The bombs begin to stick to the walls, and Cap sees them, holding up her shield when there's a loud boom. Gwen groans as she tries to get back up, and there's a voice in her head asking if she's still in there. She groans a response, and the voice tells her that her name is Director Carter of S.H.I.E.L.D., Captain America's boss. And Gwen asks, how am I hearing you? Because if you're a ghost, that would be totally cool. Peggy sighs, telling her no, she's bouncing a signal off of Cap's helmet radio and beaming it into her skull via, never mind. Just remember phone taps are nothing. Gwen looks around saying, oh God, Harry, what happened to Harry? And Peggy says that she'll be the one asking the questions here. For now, she's going to need to use the mutagen suppressant that Cap was about to use. There should be several doses in Cap's belt. Gwen pulls them out and says that she's got them, sir, uh, ma'am, uh, sir, ma'am. Gwen starts to get back up, and as she looks over, she sees Harry's arm lying on the ground, and she asks how. 
How could anyone survive that? Peggy tells her because he has the mutagen, it seeks out trauma and regenerates it after injury. Bolster's weakness. The second generation is stronger and faster, but burns like wildfire. Given time, it will replace its host completely. Gwen looks at her hand, stating that she, she can't. She can't hurt anyone else. And Peggy tells her to listen. She would never have risked any of this if Cap wasn't so certain about her. So far, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been kept away from all of this solely based on her belief. But that window is closing. It is your time to shine. Gwen puts back on her mask and she grabs Cap's shield. And following the blood trail left by Harry, she inches closer to the sounds. Harry holds up his newly formed arm and he says, Hey Gwen, nice shield. Are you here to slay the dragon? Harry gets up lunging forward, but he stops himself fighting off the urge to try and kill Gwen. But Gwen tells him that she can't let him run. Not again. Not like this. Harry struggles and says that he will not let them take him. I just want to do the right thing. Gwen pauses for a moment and says, Nah, that's crap. You did this because you're wounded and helpless. Because all the other kids used to call you soft and rich. You were always terrified that they were right. As wrong as what Peter did, seeing what he was capable of made you feel small. Hell, Made me feel small too, but now I'm trying to take responsibility to own up to what I did wrong. Harry gets up, telling her, You lied to me! And Gwen tells him, Yeah, I did, and there's nothing I can do to change it. All I can do now is give you the truth. Sometimes people aren't who you remember them to be. Real people, real lives, they're flawed. Sometimes they think they're weak or even wrong. Even heroes. Spider-Woman versus the Green Goblin? Is that what we really want our future to be? Is this who you want to be? Harry looks at himself, stating, I thought I could control it. And Gwen holds out the suppressant, stating that there is still a chance. Take your life back. Harry asks why. After everything I've done, why would you give this to me? And Gwen tells him because she isn't a cop or a soldier. She doesn't want to fight him or see him dead or dissected or rotting in a cell. She knows that he can make this right, but the question is, does he want to? Harry sticks himself with a syringe stating that he guesses he's going to have to, and Gwen leans over to give him a hug. As Harry starts to change back, he asks, what about S.H.I.E.L.D.? How is she going to explain this? And Gwen says, not sure. She did lift the enchanted S.H.I.E.L.D. Maybe she can talk her way out of this. Gwen then looks back and tells him, actually, she's going to try the truth for once. They say it sets you free. With that, Harry covers himself and he runs. Later that day, George Stacy sits on his porch and Gwen asks from the rooftop, rough day at the office? She hops down and as she sits, George throws a file on the ground. Gwen looks at it and asks, what's this? And George tells her that this is the case that he will never solve, the promise that he will never be able to keep, the mystery of the disappearing lizard, the true killer of Peter Parker. Gwen starts to flip through the papers asking, what does it all mean? And Gwen takes a sip of his drink, stating that they never found the lizard after Peter died, never even looked. All because they saw Spider-Woman flee the scene and then later returned to help people. They'd never seen a more guilty conscience. I wanted so bad to find the lizard to prove your innocence so that you could have some closure. Gwen begins to state that she can explain, but George stops her stating don't. He knows the truth about what happened that day and she kept it a secret for a reason. If there's anything that he learned over the years, it's that secrets aren't always lies and facts aren't always truth. George grabs the file, stating that he's seen her world now and he's decided that it's okay if he doesn't know the whole truth because he trusts her that she does know it. Nothing that he can say will keep her from being Spider-Woman and he won't ever understand it, but he doesn't need to because it's not what she needs for from him. He quit the force today. No more being a cop because anyone can do that. From now on, he's going to be a dad. He takes the file, tossing it into the trash can, and then he throws in a match. As the file starts to burn, Gwen says that she met Captain America. And George asks, did you get a number for me? And Gwen shouts, ew, no. George then asks, so is it a Spider-Woman day or a stay and play day? A recorded dad cop. And Gwen asks, what kind of question is that? A dad cop is the best. With everything that's been going on in Gwen Stacy's life, she's beginning to question, is it all worth it? Losing her powers, having S.H.I.E.L.D. come after her, having Frank Castle, the police officer detective, coming after her. When does it end? When does she go back to being normal? As Gwen stumbles into her apartment, she gets a text from Glory asking if she's going to come out for tonight. And Gwen promptly says, I've just been feeling off. Glory asks for some truth, so Gwen begins to write back everything. How she's Spider-Woman, how she hid it from everyone, how she accidentally killed Peter Parker. Feeling like the only real thing is when she's wearing the mask, she lays awake wondering why did this all happen to her? Where was her choice? Does she deserve it? But the second that she gets ready to embrace being Spider-Woman, it's all gone. Gwen hovers her thumb over the send button and then realizes sending Glory that message may complicate things. So she deletes it and says, fine, she'll come out. The girls first go out to a concert and then to the arcade, and Glory says that she knows of a better place to finish the night off with. After walking for a while, Gwen starts to huff, asking where exactly are they going? There's nothing on this side of town. Wait! 
the Dollar Dog? How is this even possible? She, Spider Woman, destroyed this place. Glory says that it reopened a couple of days ago. This part of town is still sketchy, but ever since Spider Woman wrecked it, it's been the place to see and be seen. Gwen looks around at the customers and sees that this isn't how it used to be. It's a hangout spot for the more entitled young folk. After having a drink, a man throws up, and an employee looking up from his phone says that they need a cleanup on aisle two. Mr. Albie, the original owner before everything happened, grumbles to himself, stating, of course he'll clean it up. He's the only one here who actually works. Gwen runs up as Mr. Albie starts to mop, stating, hey, I used to work here for like a day, but this is great. This place turned out great. Mr. Albie laughs, stating, it turned out all right. Turned around and dove it straight into the ground. Those stupid spoiled children and their apps. Gwen says, well, it's crowded, which is good, right? Must be making a killing. And Mr. Albie tells her, the only killing going on here is me. I don't own the dollar dog, I'm just the manager. I had to sell the place when everything happened. That stupid spider lady and the green booger. They smashed up my business and they ruined my life. When Gwen hears that, his words really begin to sink in. He's right. She did this, all of this. She runs to the bathroom and looks up at the power up device and the injections that give her back her powers for a short time. She holds the injections over the toilet, stating that she can end this right now. She should end this right now. Be free of Spider Woman forever. But then there's a loud bang and an armed man runs into the building shouting to everyone that if they ever want to withdraw from their trust funds, they better pay up. Gwen holds up the injection wondering what to do and then everything goes quiet. Frank Castle walks in and the armed robber points his gun telling him, I'm not sure who you are stupid big guy, but no one can bench press a bullet. Frank snatches the gun bending it and throwing it to the ground and the robber shouts, please don't. Everyone hears a loud crack and Gwen runs over to see the robber on the floor with Frank standing over him. Gwen asks, Frank, did you follow me? Have you been following me? Frank tells her, you can't hide from me. I know the truth of who you are. Frank grabs Stacy by the arm, and as she tries to free herself, Frank throws her across the store. Everyone begins to panic, and Gwen reaches out to the injector, pushing the button. She gets back up, covering the device, and then throws Frank out the window, stating, if you came looking for me, here I am. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not going anywhere. Gwen looks back at Glory and the others and sees terror. She starts to run into the back alleys, telling herself that she just, she just has to get away. The next morning, Gwen's alarm goes off singing, wake me up before you go, go. Don't leave me hanging like a yo-yo. Gwen groans as she turns off the alarm stating, that is the stupidest way to wake up. But where is she? Dad's house? Why is she dressed? She looks at the injector and says, oh, right. The clock struck midnight. She just wanted to help a delivery guy on her way home, and after barely managing to stop the bad guy, she had to get a ride from the delivery guy. As Gwen gets out of bed, her father George calls out asking if she's there, and she puts her mask back on and gets ready to climb out the window. But really? Where would she go? It's not like she can't show him what he's already seen. However, what Gwen doesn't see is across the street, a man with cheetah print pants stares into the window. Gwen heads downstairs and she holds up the injection stating that she should just flush them right now, right? End this whole thing. And George says, why would you do that? Gwen shouts because Frank Castle saw my face. I just now put it together that he'd figure out that I was your daughter. Following her, trying to prove that she's Spider Woman. But if she's not, doesn't this all just go away? As the two talk, the man from before walks up to the house holding a sack. He pulls open one of the air vents from outside and he opens up the sack, allowing dozens of snakes to slither in. A few moments later, a snake reaches out biting George and when he sees it, he smacks it away asking, what is a snake doing here? The two get up to run, but the hallway to the front door is now covered with snakes and cobras. George turns back, opening the door to the backyard, and when he does, he sees an orangutan sitting there. The orangutan leaps up, punching George, stating, Okay! The orangutan then grabs Gwen, throwing her outside, but as Gwen gets back up, the orangutan leaves. She asks, What? He's leaving? What the hell just happened? But after the orangutan leaves, a panther jumps down and begins to growl as it walks in through the back gate. Gwen gets up and slowly backs away, stating, Okay, the injector's over there, so I'm just going to... But just then, a voice calls out to the panther, and Gwen looks up asking, Mrs. Parker? May throws the plate of food that she was carrying towards the panther, stating, Don't just stand there! Run before I come to my damn senses about what I just did! Gwen tells herself, Great! I was just saved by a plate of pot roast! Worst superhero ever! Gwen looks back at the injector and jumps for it, but before she can grab it, she feels a pull slam her arm into the ground. Craven the Hunter looks down at the injectors and picks one up, staring at it inquisitively. Gwen grabs the device, getting ready to use it, but just as she goes to press the button, Craven turns back, hitting it, shattering it into a dozen pieces. 
She falls back, staring at the device, asking, What is she supposed to do? And May tells her, You need to get back up! Pull it together or we're both going to die! Gwen jumps up, smacking the panther back, and Craven says, Ah, Spider, the stories Craven has heard. Try not to disappoint, eh? He charges in, but before Gwen could attack, Craven spins around her, grabbing her from behind. As Gwen struggles, Craven says, Majesty, such power! And Castle seeks to cage this? Bah! No man could capture such a will. Craven begins to pull off Gwen's mask and across the street, Frank gets to snapping pictures and smiles. But before he could leave, George tells him to do them both a favor and don't turn around. He's done his homework. He knows the shot won't miss. Frank holds up his arms and George asks, So what's this case? And listening to the maniac to a trapper? Couldn't get your hands even dirtier? Gwen finally manages to throw Craven off of her, but then Gwen looks back asking, Dad? And George tells her, You need to go. It was all a setup to unmask you, and I destroyed what evidence there was, and called the real police. Gwen shouts asking, You did what? They're gonna put you in jail for helping me! And George says, I can't run from it. Not this time, but you have to, at least until I... But before he could finish, Gwen punches him, knocking him out, stating that she's sorry. But she has to protect them, somehow. As Gwen goes to escape with George, the police arrive, and Craven looks at his hand, stating, I will continue the hunt. I have made an oath to Castle. Castle is owed an old debt, and with this small vial, Craven has paid it. Later that night, Gwen sits on top of a sign that states, Stop the Spider-Woman, trying to figure out what to do next when she hears a woman shouting, Stop. Gwen looks down at the Bucky Barnes burger place and sees the Bodega Bandit running out with an armful of burgers. Gwen shouts, Really? I can't even right now! Put that stuff back this instant! The Bodega Bandit looks up asking, What? Who the? But just then the store owner runs out, tackling the bandit to the ground, and Gwen thinks that maybe she should just go. A short while later, at the Reed Richards lab, Reed looks at the device stating that it's going to be a bit of a challenge. But if he's being honest, it's hard to concentrate knowing that Castle is looking for her. And here she is with her dad of all people. What's keeping him from busting down his mom's door and... Gwen stops him and says, nothing. Without her powers, there's nothing to stop him. So Reed gets back to work and Gwen says that she needs to get out of here for a bit. But she has to know, can he fix it? Reed tells her, yeah, he can fix it. But the problem is that it's still going to use her power-ups. She only has five left. Gwen says, wait, five? That's not right, I should have six. Oh God, what happened to number six? Meanwhile, over at Oscorp offices, Frank holds out the six vials, stating one of his men lifted it from Spider-Woman. It's the key to her powers and to his case. It's the key to clearing his son Harry's name. Norman tosses the vial back, stating that Harry made his choices. He knew the risks in pursuing Spider-Woman in going against S.H.I.E.L.D. The Green Goblin is not Oscorp's mess to clean up. Frank then tosses his case file onto the desk, stating, Sure, why are you starting to cover your tracks now, though? A decade ago, a teenage girl named Cindy Moon who was bitten by a radioactive spider created in your labs. A massive lawsuit followed. Your scientists testified that the spider's bite likely led to either death or mutation. You didn't create Spider-Woman, but you did plant the seeds for her. I can prove the link between this radiation and her powers. You will help me. You will help me catch Spider-Woman. And after that, Harry Osborne's name will be clear, and we can go back to being a family again. Outside of Oscorp, detectives DeWolf and Grimm stake out, and DeWolf says that she really hates the idea of tailing one of her own men. Just then, Frank walks out of the building, and DeWolf jumps out of the car, telling Frank that they need to talk. He needs to tell her about what's going on. He owes it to her as a partner. These witnesses, they say that he's stalking George Stacy's daughter. Whatever he's doing, whatever this is really about, it isn't the right way. Frank tells her that Justice will find the Spider-Woman. He's doing his job. If her bosses don't like it, they're welcome to try and stop him. A little while later in the park, Gwen sits on a bench thinking about everything that has happened, the things that she's seen, the things that she's done. Jessica Drew from the other universe is already cleaning up her messes. Cindy Moon has her own problems. Cap can't see her like this. The cops would never believe her. And Matt Murdock? Just then a voice shouts, Hey! Gwen looks up and sees the Bodega Bandit standing there and asks, What? But Diego Bandit says, You yelled at me back at the Bucky Barnes. How come? Gwen pauses for a moment and asks, Wait, how are you here? How did you get free? You were stealing. The Bandit takes out a burger and starts eating, stating, So? You're just some girl. There's plenty of burgers out there for you. Not your job to stop me. No one else cares. Gwen says, So, are you saying that you don't even get to go to jail when you're caught? And the Bandit says, Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. But if I do, I just call up my daddy and he tells the cops to let me go. People always tell me that what I'm doing is wrong, but they don't really act like it is. Nobody but Spider-Woman. Sometimes she makes me think about quitting. Want the rest of this burger? I'm not even hungry. Gwen looks back up from the billboard of her and then rushes back to Reed's house to check in. Reed tells her, all right, changes are simple. Left web shooter is also an isotope activator. 
The right houses the power-ups. Device on the left, batteries on the right. To activate your powers, you just bang the bands together really hard and scream, I have the power! Gwen laughs and says that this is perfect. Thanks. George groans as he starts to wake up and he asks, where are we? And Gwen tells him to take it easy. George says that she's still in her costume and Frank is still. And Gwen says she knows that's why she's gotta go. George leans up stating that she can't, but Gwen puts on her mask telling him that it's fine, she can. She's the only one who can. Gwen rushes out of the building and out onto the streets, knowing that Frank is watching and bangs her web shooters together. She then jumps down and tells herself that stopping Frank is her responsibility. But before Gwen can attack, Frank fires a repulsor blast from a gauntlet that he took while working for Tony Stark's War Machine project, barely missing her. Gwen tumbles to the ground and Frank walks up to her holding out his arm stating, you have no idea how badly I wanted a second chance at you. Gwen yells, you hurt me and threatened my family. Why, for what? Because you got your butt kicked by a girl? Gwen springs back up, punching Frank to the ground, and as he gets up, he fires another blast, ripping through the ground and into nearby homes. As Gwen manages to get another hit in, Frank blasts her back into another building and slowly begins making his way towards her. She jumps up, grabbing the gauntlet to try and take it off, but as her fingers touch the metal, it electrocutes her. She screams in pain as she falls back, and Frank holds out his arm, stating, I will show you how this is going to end. I'm gonna drop what's left of you in the steps of the precinct, and they're gonna give me a medal for it. Just then, George's voice calls out to him, stating that if he makes another move, they're gonna pin it on his casket. Step away from her and drop the weapon now. Frank yells, asking, Do you really think that's going to stop me? And George tells him, You've been living your whole life in fear. Don't let it end that way. And then, George pulls the hammer back on the gun. Frank shouts, All it takes is one twitch and this is over. She dies. Maybe both of you could die, or you could just walk away. You're being punished for his lies. This isn't justice. Frank begins to charge another blast, now aimed at George, and as he fires, Gwen jumps up, tackling Frank to the ground. The blast tears through the building, and as Frank gets up, he pins Gwen down with the gauntlet, shocking her. Gwen yells, you want to shoot stupid laser beams? Then try shooting one through your own chest. She pulls back an arm and starts to web the gauntlet to Frank's chest and then kicks him away, calling out to her dad. She runs over to the ledge to jump, but then there's a loud BAM! And Gwen sighs, stating, of course he's got a gun. How could I have been so stupid? As Frank is ready to fire again, DeWolf stands over him with her gun, telling her not to move. Do not do this. Gwen leaps off the ledge, grabbing George and swings away. And Frank tells her, you deserve this. They deserve this. DeWolf asks if Spider-Woman is a criminal for the damage that falls in her wake, then what does that make him? Frank continues pulling the trigger, laughing as it spins empty and then jumps off the roof. Grimm runs up stating that he's got a shot and DeWolf tells him no, not like that, never like that. A short way down the street, Gwen lands on a building, setting George down, asking what was he thinking. She's sorry, this is all her fault. She doesn't know how to protect them. She doesn't know how to break the cycle. Maybe she can't. And George tells her that if she can't, maybe he can. He'll turn himself in. Gwen screams that he can't. She can't do this alone, but George hugs her, telling her that she was never alone. That's how he finally stands beside her. She is Spider-Woman. That's her gift. That's her secret. He will defend her until the day that he dies. He's a policeman. This is his duty. As the police choppers start to come in, Gwen covers her face as she cries. She jumps away. A couple weeks later, at the Dollar Dog, she reads a news article on her phone about Frank, when a familiar voice tells her that she knows the drill. It's the corn dogs are her life. After a second, she looks up and without saying a word, tosses the bodega bandit outside. She then shouts to everyone, in there with a man bun, get out to, in fact, everyone out. Gwen starts to clean up, and as she takes out the trash, she continues to read the article of how her father is refusing any legal counsel. She grips the phone hard and cracks the screen. A voice says, A literal crossroads, huh? Is that the idea here? Really, Miss Stacy. Even out of mask, your flair for the melodrama remains. Your father's a brave man. Stone stupid, but brave. Now he's gone, and you're left between a rock and a hard place, as hard as Mr. Stacy's head. So, just what do you do, Miss Stacy? Puff out your chest and act brave like daddy? Or do you do what he'd never do? Use your head. Gwen says that he promised, if she accepted, that he can do this. From the shadows, Matt laughs, telling him, <laughs> Yes, I know Foggy Nelson's game very well. We can beat him. We can free George Stacy, but only if your father will work for me. Gwen says that he will. She'll make sure of it. And Matt Murdock then jumps down, stating, Excellent! Seems we have a deal. The Kingpin is at your service. And Spider-Woman is now mine. As Harry Osborne stands in the streets of Madripoor, he makes a call to Gwen's phone, only to get her voicemail. The beep goes off, and Harry tells her, It's me again. I'm, uh, I'm in a hurry. Get my father to stop. Make them stop, please. They're just making things worse. He then hangs up the phone and looks back at all of the hand ninjas surrounding him. 
Meanwhile, back in Manhattan, Gwen visits the police station to see her father, and Matt Murdock tells them that they need to move this along. George's trial is being fast-tracked. Gwen tells him, wait a second. He said that it would take months, and Matt tells her. He said that many things were likely, given her father's cooperation. Our current situation is that George Stacy's refusal to refute the charges against him plays it out like guilt. What's coming isn't a trial, it's a stage, a soapbox that her father can stand on and shout his side to the world. So what happens when he does that and the world doesn't care? The choice is clear. You honor our deal or he rots in prison. Either way, we're done for today, Gwen. Matt grabs Gwen by the arm, but George Stacy lunges at Matt, telling him, You are not going to threaten us! And Matt pushes back, stating, Threaten? I wouldn't dare! Gwen still buys into your little code of honor. But how good are those little merit badges going to be when Gwen is all out there alone, Mr. Stacy? It is in your best interest to not break our deal. And George shouts that he will break him for. But Gwen steps between them, telling them to stop. You're here because of me, Dad. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you out. As Gwen and Matt leave, they pass Officer Boyle and another officer. And Matt grabs Gwen by the shoulder, asking, Do you take me to be a clown? Gwen asks what he means, and he shouts, I asked you, do you take me for a clown? I asked you to assure your father's cooperation. I asked you to honor our deal, Miss Stacy. So far, I've gotten so very little of what I've asked for. The other officer with Boyle steps in, asking Gwen if the man is giving her any trouble. But Boyle pushes them back, asking, Do you know who that is? That is Matt Murdock. And the officer steps back, stating, Wait, that's Kingpin? And the boy turns around, stating, Just shut up and walk away. Gwen tells Matt that he can't scare her under doing whatever he wants like everyone else. Like he said, they have a deal, and he owes her as well. Matt yells that he wants her suited up and powered up. What he wants to see is Spider-Woman atop Oscorp Tower in 10 minutes. And believe him, she will want to take this seriously. Because right now, he is no longer asking. 10 minutes later at Norman Osborne's office, Norman looks up to see Gwen in her costume. And he asks Matt if he's serious. Spider-Woman is a killer. Harry lost his damned mind seeking vengeance for what she did to the Parker boy. And Gwen tells Norman, no, Peter Parker was my friend and your son, Harry, he's also my friend. Matt then tells them, look, I know what happened to Harry. After his little run-in with Spider-Woman, he came running to daddy for help. I know that Harry took the lizard mutagen and needed help, but he never got any from dad. I also know that there was a recent run-in with Frank Castle and you left Oscorp a little radioactive isotope like this one. Norman asks, so what do you want? Me to recreate Spider-Woman's powers? And Matt laughs stating, Cindy Moon created Spider-Woman. That would be like asking a house painter to recreate the Sistine Chapel. You can't do it, not exactly. You may come in, Dr. Brock. The doors open up and Elsa Brock walks in with a cart. And Norman asks, what is this? Are you working with Murdoch? Elsa pulls back the cover stating that she's been searching for what he's asked. She found a way to get his son back. And that's when a little black liquid hisses as it tries to escape. And Gwen asks, okay, what the hell is that? Elsa tells her that this is the next step. This is a new her. Cindy Moon is a genius, and by unlocking the secrets of an alien spider parasite, she not only created Spider Woman, but also handed Doc Connors the keys to his lizard formula. With Matt Murdock's encouragement, she turned their isotope research into a cure for Harry's condition. So she theorized that the two of them might have some effect on one another, perhaps burn out the lizard's regeneration powers. But to their surprise, it did more, much more. She pours the black liquid onto a lab rat, and once it's fully covered, the rat hisses and begins to savagely claw at the glass. She goes on stating that the ooze created by exposing the lizard serum to Cindy's radiation is a mutant cousin of Agent Drew's original alien parasite. It also grants host power similar to Spider-Woman's, though not without peculiarities. The venom absorbs the isotope to live, but it also amplifies it. It begins to emit its radiation. It's an odd side effect for the parasite, but deadly for the host. And that is where Spider-Woman comes in. Her body, her blood, it's completely immune to Venom's radiation. Venom can make you whole again. Gwen shouts, you are out of your minds if you think I'm going to let you infect me with some snot parasite. And Matt tells her, oh no, not yet at least. We need Harry Osborne. Your relationship is the best chance we have to luring him back home. Harry's been a lizard too long, advancing beyond any existing treatment. If we use the isotope to mutate his blood into venom, we can draw the parasite out of him. And Gwen asks what happens after that. They're going to use the toxic turtle ooze and turn her into a freak show? And Elsa tells her, no, 
you're immune to the negative effects. Your relationship would just be symbiotic. Matt then says Harry gets his own life back, Norman gets his son back, and Spider-Woman gets her powers back. And the Venom gets a new home. It's win-win-win. Gwen then shouts asking, And what do you get, Matt? Your own personal pet monster? A freak you can- But Norman stops her telling her, Please. Harry did this because of you. Because he thought you were- And Gwen stops him telling him, No. Harry did it to himself. And you could have helped him. You should have helped him. Norman looks at her telling her, Please, as his father, help me fix this. So Gwen sighs. Damn it. Fine. And later in Madripoor, the hand ninjas tell Gwen that they await her orders. She looks at them asking, What? Oh, no. Look, I appreciate the lift, but I'm really not going to do the group thing. As she swings through the city, a man watches, stating, Look at that. The spider woman herself. And as the man follows, there's a schnick. A short while later, Gwen catches up with Harry, telling him to just stop. He spins back, knocking up bits of gravel and debris with his mutated lizard arm, and then he jumps down into the alleyway. Gwen follows, tackling him, shouting, STOP, damn it! And the two bounce into the street. But as Gwen gets back up, she tells him that they need to stop running. She is here to help him. He catches his breath, stating that he's not running from her. She was followed by him. Gwen looks back to see where Harry is pointing and sees a man in a cowboy hat asking, Okay, who's that? The man walks out of the shadows stating, I misjudged this for an easy bounty. You fought well, honorably even, but now it's time to come along peacefully. Gwen tells the man that she doesn't know who he is or what business he has with Harry, but the man stops her. <laughs> no, darling, don't expect that you would know my business. Not a lot of folks breathe and who do. There's a snick as three claws pop out of the man's knuckles and he lunges forward, swinging them at Gwen. She manages to duck behind the man, kicking him into a nearby guy, and then runs over to Harry, telling him that they got a ghost out like Swayze. As Harry gets back up, he sees all the ninjas following Gwen. And Gwen tells him, okay, you're not really going to believe this, but they're with me. Harry stares for a moment, stating, wait, you're working with the hand? They've been hunting me for weeks. All the ninjas on the rooftops release their arrows, most of which land directly into the man's chest. Gwen grabs Harry, ducking through the crossfire from the ninja, stating, Look, I know this looks bad, but... And Harry stops her. Bad? It doesn't get much worse than this. That guy that's Logan, the immortal Mr. Murder Hands. Legend has it that he was a samurai, but instead of dying in the battlefield, he was revived to live out the lives of all the people that he killed. He ended up in America working for S.H.I.E.L.D. Gwen asks, So S.H.I.E.L.D. has their own personal maniac? And Harry says, sort of. Mr. Murder Hands is Black Ops. Hire to help that they call in when things are too messy. Gwen then says, can we not call him Mr. Murder Hands? That name would be too self-fulfilling. Call him Wolverine. I know one of those. Just as Gwen and Harry get away from the fight, a woman jumps down from a building, phasing through Gwen and Harry. Harry swipes at her, but the woman turns back, popping a single claw out to Harry's neck, stating that he's so special that S.H.I.E.L.D. has sent in the Shadow Cat. Harry tells Shadowcat to do it. Think this is messy? I'm the lizard now! You know what kind of monster will grow in my place? Gwen yells for everyone, just shut up! Look, lady, S.H.I.E.L.D. wants to do experiments on Harry. All I want to do is cure him. Shadowcat tells her, you are barking up the wrong tree. I'm here to do a job. And that's when there's a sonic blast and Shadowcat screams. Logan walks up holding a small device, telling them, tsk, tsk, you know I love you, kitty, but this bounty is mine. As Shadowcat takes out the rest of her claws, Gwen helps Harry get back up, stating, This is insane! Everyone is insane! God! With Logan and Shadowcat distracted, Gwen and Harry then make a break for it down an alleyway, with Harry stating, Just up ahead. Gwen then begins to explain how she can use her power-ups to draw out the lizard mutagen, and then the mutagen changes into something that's supposed to fix her powers. Harry begins rummaging through a tent, asking, Where is it? As a D20 die falls out, Harry frantically swipes at it, and Gwen tells him, we have to hurry. You don't know what's at stake here. Harry turns back and hands Gwen the die that they used to play Dungeons and Dragons with. And he says, I do. I know what's at stake. I always have. That's when the ninjas jump down telling Gwen that they can't keep the bounty hunters back for much longer. They must get to the transports now. Harry begins to growl. And as Gwen looks at the die, she pulls her mask down stating, okay, one last time, one last roll. Later, after getting away from the hand and shoplifting, Gwen and Harry run into an alleyway to catch their breath. Harry starts to stuff his face with whatever he can grab from the bag that they took from the store. But as a rat runs by, he snatches it. Gwen smacks the rat out of his hand, asking, What the hell? We already stick out like a sore thumb. Do you know how not to draw attention to us? We have shield bounty hunters and Murdoch's ninjas to deal with. We can't risk them catching our scent from something stupid like stolen energy drinks. Harry goes back to eating from the bag, stating, Fine. 
More for me. As Harry munches away, Gwen sighs as she leans up against the wall and sits down. She thinks of what she should do, and that's when she dumps out her bag, grabbing her phone, calling Matt. Matt picks up from a club, stating, well, well, it must be early for you over there. What's the matter? Your latest betrayal eating away at your conscience? Gwen says, oh, screw you. You knew S.H.I.E.L.D. sent those maniacs after Harry. And Matt laughs, of course I did. S.H.I.E.L.D. will now dissect your little friend there unless you bring him back. This is your second strike. Come home and we'll call this a foul ball. Gwen tells him, no, I don't trust you. Harry is safer with me. So Matt then asks, what does Harry think of this? And Harry yells as he smashes the phone. Before getting ready to move out, Harry says, of course this is going to be a trap. We have to split up. Gwen tells him, yeah, no, S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't after me and Murdoch knows that I got to go home eventually. You're going to need a better plan if you want me to ditch you. Harry then asks, this cure, how does it work? Why do I need you? So Gwen explains how Cindy Moon unlocked the genetic code of an alien spider and used it to create her powers. Peter and Doc Connors then used her research to create the lizard mutagen. The radiation in her power-ups has a strange effect on the lizard DNA by pulling it out of the host. It mutates into some sort of needy black goop. But since she's immune to the radiation, she is the only one who can bond with it without killing its host. Harry pauses and waits. You have isotopes? Gwen tells him, no way. They have no clue what they're doing. But what the hell do we do once the serum is mutated into that gloop? I don't want that stuff anywhere near me. Maybe we can talk to Reed or Jessica. And Harry shouts, we can't trust anyone. You can see why everyone wants my blood. It's turning me into a freaking monster. Gwen grabs Harry, telling him to calm down. She's doing everything that she can. And then she stops. The hand ninjas jump down, attacking Harry. As Gwen is pushed to the ground, she realizes something. There's no way to save both of them. It's Lizard or Spider Woman, she has to choose. So she pulls down her mask, and just as a ninja is about to strike her, Logan runs in, cutting him. Gwen smacks the injector, getting ready to fight, but a hand phases through the wall, and Shadow Cat grabs her, telling her, nah-uh. She presses her knuckles to Gwen's head, telling her, you're dumb enough to walk into this. And Gwen shouts, you have no idea what you're doing. Murdoch is playing you all. And Shadowcat says, Aw, don't you worry, non-precious. The professionals are here. Be grateful. We got this. Meanwhile, back in George Stacy's holding cell, he hears the cell doors unlock and then sees Alexi standing there. George asks, What the hell is this? That man tried to kill me once before. I don't know what the Kingpin has on you, but... The guard looks back and says, I don't know any Kingpin. I'm just doing my job. Just like our captain should have. The guard takes off Alexi's cuff, telling him, Make it look good. Not like. But before the guard could finish, Alexi punches him in the face. He walks into the cell, cracking his knuckles, telling Murdoch that his tab is due. Back over at the first floor elevators, DeWolf pushes the button to the ninth floor and asks Officer Boyle where he's headed, officer. And Boyle says, Boyle, ma'am. Funny enough, I'm headed to the ninth floor too. Reckon we're visiting a mutual friend. Gonna drop off a little reading material. The wolf looks at the cover and reads Dad's Sword and laughs, stating that George loves a good fantasy. Boyo then laughs and says that he's never heard anyone call him George before. Make it sound like he's almost... And the wolf stops him. Human? That's the best part about Captain George Stacy. He's just a human like the rest of us. As the doors open, DeWolf and Boyle step out and see the security guard is missing. DeWolf grabs her gun while Boyle and her start to make their way through a row of holding cells. When DeWolf sees Alexi, she tells Boyle to get some help. She'll deal with Rhino over there. Alexi charges at DeWolf as she starts firing, stating, Ha! Rhino! I like that nickname! After knocking DeWolf to the ground, Otomo appears telling him the job is done, they must go. As the smoke fills the room, DeWolf gets back up, running to George's cell, calling out to him. But when she looks back in the cell, she sees George Stacy laying there on the floor. Back in Madripoor, Logan continues fighting with Harry in his full lizard form, while Shadowcat holds Gwen in place to watch. Gwen struggles to free herself, shouting to Shadowcat, Can't you see? The more you fight, the more of a monster my friend turns into. It wasn't his decision to fight. Shadowcat flashes back to a time when she was younger, and how she was used to help create Logan. Shadowcat throws Gwen to the ground, stating, Damn you! Striker! Weapon X! They made me! And Gwen asks, What are you? But Shadowcat grabs her, shouting, I was just a little girl! I thought I was helping him! I had no choice. Gwen stops and tells her, You do now though, right? So Shadowcat pauses for a moment and then says, I'll separate them. But whatever I'm going to do, it better be worth it. Logan cuts into Harry across his chest, and Harry roars as he charges, turning over a police car. Logan gets behind him, jumping up, swiping at his neck again, and as he does, he ends up phasing through with Shadowcat telling him to stop. Logan asks her, what are you doing? 
And Shadowcat pulls him away, stating, It's not worth it. Look around. Is all this destruction worth it? Gwen gets up, kicking Harry in the head, stunning him, asking Shadowcat if she can phase people into things. She laughs, asking, How much of him? As Gwen charges back in, Shadowcat grabs onto Harry's tail, stating that she's ready. Harry pulls back one of his massive arms swinging, but his arm goes through Gwen and into the street. With Harry locked in place, Gwen grabs a handful of isotopes, holding them in front of Harry, stating that she's sorry. But whatever happens next, it isn't his burden to carry anymore. Slowly, the mutagen creeps through Harry through his cuts, turning into the black goo, turning into venom like before. And as venom grows, it looms over Gwen, and she tells him, this is all on her now. Back in Manhattan, the medics rush George Stacy into an ambulance, and as they prep to leave, DeWolf notices D.A. Franklin Nelson watching. She grabs him, asking, why, Foggy? Do you even know why? You and Murdoch, do you have any idea what you've done? Gwen Stacy stands over Harry Osborne's body, where she waits for Venom to bond with her, thinking that this will just be another thing she has to deal with, a symbiote sharing her body. However, the symbiote doesn't go for her, and instead it lunges straight for Logan. Logan pops his claws, telling Shadowcat, get behind me. And as she swings, the black goo covers his face. Logan falls to his knees, screaming in pain as the Venom symbiote bonds. But because of Logan's healing factor, he doesn't die. As the screaming stops, Shadowcat asks him if he's okay, and Logan stands it back up, wearing a black suit of armor, stating, We're feeling better than ever before. The police begin to surround everyone, and Gwen shouts at them all to get back. There's something wrong! But Logan laughs. <laughs> Nothing's wrong! And he runs through slicing up the officers. Meanwhile, back in Manhattan, DA Franklin Nelson stands outside the ICU on the phone telling Matt Murdock that he just wanted George Stacy silenced, not dead. Matt tells him that George Stacy isn't dead, at least not yet. A coma is club med compared to what was waiting us if he had taken the stand. As Foggy Nelson goes on, DeWolf looks back at him and says that he thinks that she knows. Matt tells him to just make sure that the captain's room is heavily guarded. After all, Spider-Woman is still on the loose and she betrayed us. As Matt hangs up, he looks down at the hand ninjas that Gwen stopped, and then notices her back. He reaches down, picking up her portal watch, telling himself, my my, Gwen would lose her head if it wasn't attached. Back out on the streets, Shadowcat grabs onto Logan, telling him that he needs to stop, but Logan laughs. <laughs> Sorry, party's just getting started. He pushes the sonic disruptor, stunning himself, Shadow Cat and Venom. He drops the device and Gwen quickly grabs it, but also she sees Venom beginning to separate from Logan. Shadow Cat calls out to her not to turn it off, but Gwen hits the button, stopping it, stating, No, we can't kill him. They would both die if I didn't turn off the stun. Venom begins to bond back with Logan, but as he runs away, Gwen says, Don't worry, I got an idea. A short distance away, Logan jumps through the alleyway and Gwen swings overhead with Shadow Cat as Shadow Cat is yelling for him to stomp. Gwen releases her webs and jumps off a trolley, telling Shadowcat to just stick to the plan. The two tackle onto Logan, and Shadowcat uses her powers to phase into Logan and pull him out of Venom. But as the three land, Gwen says that that can't be good. That was way too easy. Either way, we need to get out of here. Shadowcat helps Logan up, and the two begin running, with Gwen holding out the sonic disruptor, telling them both, Here goes nothing. She pushes the button, and the sonic waves then hit Venom, sending Venom into a frenzy. Gwen backs up to a wall, mumbling to herself, Please work, please work, please work. And Venom latches himself onto Gwen, and it begins to take her over. But during this, Matt Murdock holds out her phone, telling himself, She really blew it this time. She has one chance to be whole and in control again. I could have told her the sound was our first weapon against that creature. But just before Venom fully covers Gwen, she webs her phone out of Matt's hand, and she begins to play music. And a few seconds later, the now fully bonded Gwen falls to the ground, with Matt asking how does she feel. Gwen gets up and charges at him, grabbing him by the neck, letting the suit fade, telling him, I feel great. He struggles to breathe, asking how is she resisting, and Gwen points to her earbuds, telling him, sound. When it comes to music, turns out me and Venom like the same kind of beats. And Matt lets out a laugh, telling her, ha ha, well done, triumphant at last. But this isn't a game of checkers, it's a game of chess. You really should have kept a better eye on your little portal watch. Have you learned nothing? Being so distracted can make you lose sight of what really matters. The portal then begins to open up, and Gwen sees her father in the hospital. She slams Matt onto the ground, asking, What did you do? 
And Matt tells her, it wasn't me. You're the one who left. Dropping her phone, calling to George. And as she picks up his hand, he doesn't respond. Seconds later, officers kick in the door, telling Gwen to freeze. But Gwen turns back to them, telling them, you were supposed to protect him. And she begins to lash out, knocking one of the officers down. And as the second one fires his gun, he hits Gwen in the armor. She walks over, covering the gun, and then smacks it down, breaking the officer's wrist. She then grabs DeWolf by the throat, and DeWolf says, No! Don't do this! I can't help you! Like this! And as Gwen loosens her grip, she tosses DeWolf to the ground, telling her, You're right. You can't help him. And when I find whoever did this, we will hurt them. Later in Hell's Kitchen, Gwen storms into a bar, telling them, I'm only going to ask once, Fancy Dan. Where is he? Where is the rhino? Dan laughs, telling her, Give me a friggin' break. Alexi fights Spider-Woman once and now thinks he's some kind of supervillain. Gwen slams her fist down, telling them, Now! And Dan sighs. You don't want to leave? Fine. Montana throws his rope around Gwen and Gwen uses it to throw him across the bar. Ox runs at her and swings, but Gwen catches it and begins to crush his hand. Okay, let's try it your way. She begins to beat into the men, feeling Venom slowly taking over, so she runs over to the jukebox, putting a quarter of him to play music. As she falls to her knees, breathing heavily, she lets the music bring her back. And after a little while, Gwen takes Dan to the roof, hanging him over the street with webbing as he screams to let him go. He shouts that he doesn't know anything, but as Gwen plucks the webbing, she says that she thought he was the big man. Won't making an example of him make his friends a bit more cooperative? Dan screams at her to wait, but before she can cut the last strand, there's an explosion of smoke and Otomo calls out to her. Gwen looks back and Otomo throws a matchbook of a bar called Jax at her, telling her that he brings word from Master Murdoch. Alexi is no longer under their protection. If it's the rhino that she seeks, she'll find him there. Gwen asks, are you kidding? This has to be a joke. Do you think I'm stupid? But watching this conversation from another rooftop is a scruffy Frank Castle. Outside of the police station, an officer picks up his phone and he says that he understands the Jack's bar. You can count on us, Mr. Murdoch. The officer grabs his shotgun and tells the other, all right, boy, sewed up, spider woman is on her way. Over at the bar, Rhino lays his head on it and Matt asks, would you like another round? But as he goes on to answer, Gwen shouts for him, telling him, you owe me in blood. Matt gets up from his stool, stating, oh, would you look at that on my cue? Good luck, Alexi. Gwen shouts to Matt, you aren't going anywhere. And as Matt opens up a portal, he asks, are you really going to waste this chance to come after me? Use that power to punish the man who actually hurt your father. Gwen looks back at Rhino and as he swings, she ducks, swiping her claws, cutting into Rhino's chest. She then creates a thin string of webbing, wrapping it around the rhino's neck when tear gas is shot in from outside. The officers storm in and Gwen says, I knew this was a setup. And one officer tells another, keep those sonic batons ready and keep the camera going. Gwen thinks to herself, is this what you really have? You want proof? Well, we don't care. But before the officers can move in, a large figure rushes through, grabbing Gwen, snapping her back to reality. She gets up coughing and sees Frank Castle. And as she asks what he's doing here, he tells her to stand down. This battle isn't with you. This time it's war. Frank then aims his repulsor cannon at Rhino and fires. Venom takes back over and Gwen shouts, Ours! Rhino was ours! And she lets out a horrifying scream. Later, Gwen sits alone on a building, stating that Rhino's dead. He has to be. She didn't mean to kill him. She didn't get to kill him, but she wanted to more than anything that she's ever wanted. She has to get this thing out of her. As hunger is beginning to set in, Gwen jumps down, heading into the convenience store to get something to eat when she notices the bandit is robbing the place. He grabs up all of the ice cream sandwiches and begins to run out of the store laughing, with the clerk shouting that that just ain't right, man. Gwen follows him out and as he stops to let his latest score sink in, Gwen jumps to top him. Bandit begins to scrounge up the ice cream sandwiches, begging her not to, but Gwen tells him, we are tired of this. We are bored of your obnoxious game. You are everything wrong with this world. As broken as it's justice, a joke that has gone on too long. The bandit gets down to his knees, pleading with Gwen, telling her that he didn't want to say this, but it was just a goof and now he could stop. As the bandit goes on, Gwen looks over and sees a flyer with a picture of her on it. And written on it is, 
Have you seen our friend? Please call. The bandit opens his eyes as he awaits his own death, his own arrest, whatever monster Gwen is going to do. But he doesn't see her. Later with Reed, Reed asks, he figure it out? Shield's encryption software is all Stark tech, and he's Reed Richards, which means unlike Tony Stark, he has skills. So of course he figured it out. He found the top secret Shield prison where they're keeping Cindy Moon. He could even disable their surveillance and use the gateway that he built to get her there. But he's going to be honest, committing serious crimes just to F with Tony. This whole new teenage mutated revenge turtle style of hers, it's borderline diabolical. Gwen tells him that she knows how it looks, but she isn't going to hurt Cindy. She just needs Cindy 65's help. Reed says, right, but owing a woman like her? Look at how the whole thing with Matt Murdock the Kingpin turned out. Gwen sighs, telling him, look, she can't explain why, but she needs to do this. It all started because of Cindy. The way she looks at it, it's Cindy who owes her. A few moments later, Gwen teleports into the prison and takes out the guards standing in front of Cindy Moon's cell. The cell door opens and Cindy, who is sitting there meditating, asks if that's what she calls stealth. May as well have just driven a truck through the wall. In the black costume, so basic. Cindy gets up asking, so what do you want? And Gwen grabs her, throwing her to the ground, shouting, You ruined my life! You know what I want to know? Why? Cindy gets up telling her, the question should be, how? How to beat Matt Murdock? How to control that devil that you have placed on your shoulder? Those kinds of things. It all started when I spent half my life trying to make something, to recapture that moment that had passed me by. And when I finally did, I felt fear. Fear with someone with your luck will never know. Gwen knocks Cindy into the wall, asking, Luck? Your answer to all of this is because you were scared of what might happen? Cindy tells her, that's right. The spider I built was my life's work. What would I have done if it had failed to work or if it had succeeded? Those dark thoughts swirling around, the doubt, the anger, the fear, that's not the creature. That's your own thoughts. The revenge that you are seeking will not set you free. The more you hate Murdoch, the smaller you'll become, the more easily he can control you. But what if you were to walk out of here today and never waste another thought on Matt Murdoch? Just then the guards start beating on the door with Cindy sitting back down telling her, you should see it now. There's nothing left to fear. As the guards knock the door down, Gwen knocks the men out and begins to leave the room when she notices that the name Felicia Hardy is on one of those doors. She looks through the window and sees Felicia sitting on her bed and she asks if it's really her. She hasn't seen her since she tried to kill Matt Murdock at her concert in Madison Square Garden. Reed leans down out of the portal yelling, you gotta hurry. I can't keep the gateway open for much longer. And Gwen tells Felicia that they need to get her out of here. But Felicia lays back down on her cot telling her, there's no point. Murdoch is the kingpin. He holds the cards and he pulls the strings. Anything or anyone not in his pocket yet, it's just a matter of time. I took my shot at him. And this is what happens when you miss. Elsewhere, Richie Rogers, the security guard in charge of watching George before his trial, sits at a blackjack table waiting for the dealer to draw. The dealer lays his card showing the 21. And Richie asks, how? I have 20. And the dealer tells him, sorry, just a tough night. As the dealer takes his chips, Richie asks him to give him another hand, put it on his tab. But the bouncer tells him that he isn't good for nothing. It's time to call it a night, Richie. Richie flashes his badge asking, do you know who I am? Do you know what I did for the Kingpin? What Murdoch owes me? Seconds later, Richie is thrown out into the alleyway with the bouncer telling him, Word of advice. Last guy blabbing about what the Kingpin owed him ended up on the news. Talk like that again and you could join him in the obituaries. Richie Rogers was never much of a cop from what she could tell. She was trying to find any reason to give him a pass, but the more she watches, jail would be good for him. He's almost as hated in the bugle as she is. As Richie passes out on his couch with a can of spaghetti, he hears a voice call out to him and feels dozens of spiders crawling on him. He gets up trying to brush those spiders off, but no matter what he does, the spiders remain. And Gwen finally asks, Did you think you could get rid of them so easily? Rid yourself of your sins! The night you opened up Captain Stacy's cell for the rhino must have been a thrill. Must have made you feel powerful. And now, here you are so low, so sick with the realization that you will never matter again. Moments later, Richie is strung up over the building, and Gwen pulls out her claws, but before she could cut the web, she hears a laugh from behind. And Frank Castle holds up holding his repulsor cannon, telling her, and people call me the Punisher. Gwen spins back, attacking him, shouting, you, you stole it! You stole the rhino from us! As Gwen fights, she remembers back to what Cindy told her that revenge will not set her free. Frank stops her, telling her, enough, you're finally free. 
No family, no one to protect, no worry to hold back. It's time. It's time to finally take this war to Murdoch. Gwen pauses and then asks, Wait, what? Have you been drinking? Are you asking for a team-up? You want a freaking team-up? She screams as she starts destroying everything around, yelling, You're the reason that this was all put into motion! Frank says that he can see that she needs some time to think, and he tosses her a phone. She takes the phone, walking back to Richie, telling him, It's your lucky day. You're going to get the chance that Captain Stacy didn't get. When that web dissolves, you have two choices. Either you walk into the police station and confess your crimes to Detective Jean DeWolf, or you run. Just know if you do run, we will find you. A short while later, Franklin is sitting in his office with Richie calling him asking what is he supposed to do. He needs help, and Franklin tells him, You did the right thing coming to me. Just sit tight. I'll be there shortly. But before Richie could even hang up the phone, several swords are stabbed into the booth and into Richie. Franklin hangs up his phone, hanging his head, while Matt sits there quietly, calmly eating an apple. Out in the streets, Ben Parker works with MJ and the others passing out flyers of Gwen when a well-dressed man bumps into him, scattering the flyers all over the place. They continue to walk, telling Ben to get out of the way next time, and Ben gets up grabbing the flyers, telling him, that's enough! He slams the man into the wall, punching the brick next to the man's head, cutting up his knuckles. The man pushes Ben off, stating that he's crazy, but Ben rubs his hand. And Gwen's voice tells him, We know how you feel. Lost. Guilty. Powerless. But there's no justice in this world. There's nothing but anger and pain. Maybe we can put an end to it. Together. She reaches out, pulling back the Venom mask, revealing her face. As everyone gets inside of the theater, Gwen sits the Parkers, MJ, and the others down and tells them, everything. How she used to hide herself so that people wouldn't know. How she's been splitting her life into two. And how she got the Venom symbiote. Before she felt terrified, but now, they don't have time for lies. They don't have that luxury. To do what needs to be done, they need to be whole. They're too angry to be scared anymore. She knows that this is a lot to take in. She's not even sure why they expected them to follow this or understand it. She's lied to them all for so long about who she really is and what she's really done. She isn't sure if they believe her, trust her, or even forgive her. It's just that what's left of Gwen Stacy has to die. She needed them to know what she did it for. MJ asks her, What do you mean by Gwen Stacy has to die? And Gwen says to her that the only way to fight Matt would be to let go of who she was forever. Ben tells Gwen that this is the price. Peter paid it. Your father paid it, and now it's your turn. You alone have been given this chance to make the bastard Matt Murdock pay for what he's done. To make losing Peter Parker count. You've been given this power for a reason. No one else. This is your responsibility. But as the girls argue with Ben Parker about sending Gwen off, the phone that Gwen was given by Frank begins to ring. She picks it up and Frank tells her that it's time. Time to finally take this war to Murdoch. Over at Matt's office though, he can hear the sounds of guns going off and screams in the hallway. Otomo runs into the office telling Matt that they have an intruder. And he responds with, yes, deploy the ninja. If it's a war he wants, then it's a war that Frank Castle will get. The explosions ring out through Matt's building, with Frank Castle continuing his path of destruction, asking Matt if he can't hear it. I want you to hear the scream of your men. A few moments later, Otomo rushes into Matt's office telling him that the last of their ninja has been rebuked. I'll delay Frank Castle as long as possible, but you must. And Matt asks, delay him? No, no. I'm afraid this has gone on far too long. It's time for him to step in. A second later, Matt's doors blow off the hinges and Frank staggers in, calling out for Matt Murdock. As he holds up the repulsor cannon, Matt tells him, I alone decide when it's time to cut the strings to this puppet show. As Frank fires, Gwen Stacy swings in, grabbing Matt by his jacket, pulling him out of the blast, shouting to Matt, you do not get off that easily. You are ours! Matt laughs as he pulls out his sword, cutting the webbing, telling her, Easy is the last thing that I want. Frank fires another blast, but Matt laughs as he jumps over it, telling Frank, Judging by that laboring wheezing, you should have gotten a Fitbit! The repulsor cannon charges back up, and before the shot can go off, his hand is webbed up and turned into a different direction. Frank yells to Gwen, asking, What are you doing? And Gwen asks, What are you doing? You want to punish Murdoch? Fine, but this? How many have you killed? Matt pauses for a moment and then looks up at the two of them. <laughs> Worst team up ever. Frank starts charging up again, shouting that she's got some gall to call him out. She's got all that power, and yet she still plays the victim. But as that blast is fired through the room, it's suddenly blocked by Captain America. The smoke clears with Cap standing there, telling them both, that will do for now, Captain Castle. Frank fires another concentrated blast, but Cap holds up her shield, walking through it. 
bashing Frank, telling him, I said to stand down. Cap looks back, telling Gwen and Matt, this is over for both of you. But Matt drops to his knees, asking, why as I live and breathe, Captain America, my hero, just in time to save me from all of these. But Cap kicks Matt in the face, telling him, you can shut up now. Gwen then asks Cap, what are you doing here? And Cap tells her, I'm gonna need you to breathe. Listen to my voice. I'm sorry that it took so long, but I'm here now. The Venom mask pulls back and Gwen asks, how? You don't even know what Murdoch has done. Cap grabs Gwen by the shoulder, telling her, I promise, no swear, that when we prove what Matt Murdoch did, he will see justice. And Gwen thinks back to all the justice that she's been seeing, how the police have treated her and her father, and then cracks Captain America in the head. She shouts, asking, justice! You don't know the things that this man can do, the things that he's done outright in the open. He's a kingpin. He owns both sides of the law. Cap reaches for her shield, but as she grabs it, Gwen steps on it, and Cap says, you need to stop this right now before Gwen punches her again, asking, what? Before it goes too far? Cap gets up, and her and Gwen begin to take punches, hitting each other, with Cap telling her, you need to stop. That, that thing is making you sick. You have to take control. Don't make me... Gwen screams as Venom lashes out, grabbing Cap by the arm and begins to bend it. As the bones snap, Cap tells her, Don't do this! You can't do this! And Gwen says, We can! And then punches Cap, knocking her out. Matt gets up, putting his glasses on. His blood is beginning to drip from his face, telling her, My God, look at you. You just punched the American flag in the face. I am so proud. Gwen grabs Matt by the throat, though, holding him over the ledge, telling him, You will shut up! You will shut up and die! Matt begins to cough up on his own blood, and he says, Finally, you see what power really is. Finally, I'm not alone. Gwen screams, throwing Matt back to the floor, telling him, I can't. I won't be like you. And Matt laughs. Oh, poor Gwenny. Reaching down with all your hate. Strike me down in anger. And you didn't even enjoy it. Just then, the portal watch begins to beep. And before Gwen realizes what is even happening, a portal opens up beneath her feet. Everyone fades to black as Gwen falls through space and time. And when she opens up her eyes, she hears a voice asking, Spider-Man? Gwen looks up and sees herself, and then simply asks, what the? As Gwen is sitting at a diner, staring at her cup of coffee, the Gwendolyn of this world says that she's not so sure on the rules of this sort of thing. But no matter where anyone is from, no place makes a better pastrami than this place right here. Gwen stays silent, and Gwendolyn tells her, okay, no sandwich, no small talk, Straight to it then. We got off to a weird start in the alleyway, and there was a lot of freaking out. But uh, just say you're not a clone. It might sound strange, but Professor Warren's whole darn genetics midterm was about cloning. Transgenics, they call it. Gwen tells herself that she should just say it. She should just get out of here. But then she'd have to deal with somebody else's problems, and that'll just waste their time. She slams her fist on the table and gets up telling her, I'm sorry, I, I just don't have time for this. Gwendolyn chases her out, yelling for her to hang on. Just wait a second. My identical twin just fell out of a hole in the sky. And but Gwen pulls her arm back, telling her, Every second that I'm here, I risk everything. We don't belong here. As Gwen changes into her costume, she swings away. And Gwendolyn then asks, what did she mean by we? The next morning, Gwen heads over to the Baxter building, home of the Fantastic Four, with Reed Richards looking for help. She sees Reed in his lab and she begins to knock on the window, but Reed just, well, continues to work. She yells that she knows that he can hear her, can he just? But before she could get another word out, an automated voice tells her, Attention Spider-Man, while we empathize with the urgency of your situation, we trust that you can understand privacy is precious. With that, we kindly urge you to direct all contact through the proper channels. Gwen stops, asking, what, Spider-Man? I'm not Spider-Man, and I'm right here. As Gwen bangs on the window again, the building's defense systems electrocute her, sending her down into the dumpster below. Later, back with Gwendolyn, the two sit and eat a hot dog. Gwendolyn says that if she understands this, an alternate reality of herself just fell out of the sky. And in this parallel world, are we talking like same physical sciences? Or is it like antimatter? Or something like the negative zone? Gwen takes another bite, telling her, don't look at me for answers. 
I'm just a musician, and my only hobby is beating on things with sticks. My failsafe didn't even work. Jessica Drew once told me, when lost in time and space, find a Reed Richards, except, well, that didn't work. Gwendolyn asks, who? Well, whatever the case, we need to try and find a way to get you back home. Meanwhile, back on Earth-65, the home planet of Gwen, Captain America stops by Matt's apartment and sees everything ready to move, asking, are you moving out or are you just moving on? Matt laughs, telling her, I was attacked in my own home. We both saw the monster spider woman has become firsthand, and we both felt it, or were you beaten unconscious by the time the monster escaped down the magic hole or not? Cap scoffs, telling him that the sting must have hurt to have spider woman slip through his grasp. All that time, all that effort that he was putting into destroying her, and all it took her was 60 seconds to unravel it. He got sloppy. He showed his hand too early. The clock is ticking. What good is that hand when he is without the mask? Matt looks back at Cap telling her, Look, if you're wondering where Gwen went, I don't know. I wasn't the one who sent her away. As painful as it is for me to admit, this time, I'm as lost as any of you. Back with our two Gwens in the other universe, though, the pair turn to the only other person that they can get in touch with, Tony Stark. Tony stares, asking, so, uh, this is a trap, right? Clones, evil robots? Because I'm nearly as smart as I am devilishly handsome and sinfully. But twin college coeds, Those don't show up on anyone's doorstep, not even mine. Gwendolyn holds up paper telling him that they've got a pretty revolutionary scientific hypothesis that they'd like to share with him. It's something that could be like unearthing a treasure trove of scientific knowledge. While Gwendolyn goes on, Gwen herself gets frustrated and shouts, Look, we aren't gonna beg you. But if you don't have time for the biggest discovery since the negative zone, then we'll just find someone else who will. Like Reed Richards. And a short while later, while Hank Pym is looking over the paper, he says, Hmm, yeah, yeah, maybe. Have you showed Reed yet? Tony asks, What? Hell no. But these thin spots, they're brittle pieces in the membrane of the multiverse? I mean, why not? We've seen far crazier things, Hank. After a few more minutes, Tony comes back telling him, Okay, my colleague and I agree that your hypothesis is a precious pearl. But we must ask, what led you to us? Gwendolyn tries to come up with something, but Gwen just stops her, telling her, I know someone who has punched a hole through about six million of those weak spots in the multiverse. They traveled across the multiverse this way for over 75 years. The science is reality. Tony then asks if they're willing to prove their little theory holds even a grain of possibility. But Gwen tells him yes. So Tony says good. Because unless they've got something native to another reality to use for calibration, their thin spots are still just a wild theory. But hey, he's rich. He can invest in a long shot. Consider this device a startup fund. Now get out there and prove the impossible. Later, as the two are now standing on the George Washington Bridge, Gwen asks, This? Really? This is the spot? And Gwendolyn tells her yes. The space-time membrane is the thinnest at the bottom of the bridge, just below the surface of the water. They can't swim there because they'll need to generate enough force to break through that spot. Gwen sighs, telling her that this is just too damn on the nose to be wrong. Let's just get it over with. So Gwendolyn climbs onto Gwen's back and the two web up to the top. As they look down, Gwendolyn tells Gwen that no matter what happens, she has to remember one thing. Her story didn't end here. Never forget how lucky you are. Gwen walks to the ledge and takes a step forward. So many things have happened on this bridge. So many have fallen here. But no one has ever jumped. As Gwen jets down towards the surface of the water, the light begins to shine, and then suddenly, she's gone. And later at the office is the J. Jonah Jameson, back on Earth-65. He asks, Okay, so let's assume I believe you. Why come to me? Why not the police? Gwen interrupts him, telling him that she can't trust the police, not anymore. Jonah laughs, telling her, Of course, but you trust me, really. Gwen tells him no. She never came solely to him. After Peter Parker's death, he blamed her without evidence, picked a side that would grab him the most headlines. But he was there to start. He's a part of this no matter what she wants. He made sure of that, and that is what she trusts him. That he just can't walk away from the biggest headline that this town's even seen. The truth about Spider-Woman. The truth about Gwen Stacy. With the publication of Gwen's story about everything out in the open, Matt Murdock sits in a dark room with monitors for all four branches of the hand. One voice says that he has them worried, but now, not that they're alarmed, but his public battle with Frank Castle and Spider-Woman, these theatrics put the hand at risk of exposure. Matt quietly laughs, asking, what? You're going to lecture me? Give me a list of options? 
possibly an ultimatum? And another voice asks, do you really believe that we just let you walk away after all those people that died on your watch? Matt stands up stating, I'd be doing cartwheels while everything exploded in slow motion. The first voice then says that he must listen well. There's nothing for him out there. He is nothing without the hand. He straightens up his jacket and he turns off the monitors telling himself, that is correct, nothing. Nothing to hide, nothing to lose, nothing to fear. Let the hand come for me, do their worst. I've seen worse. Later that night as Gwen is sitting in the band hall playing with the Venom spiders while Mary Jane says that it's kinda strange. Gwen Stacy calling for a band practice instead of missing it. If that isn't plot twist, she doesn't know what is. Gwen tells them that she needs their help. Murdoch has stolen something from her, a web watch. It's a device that can open up a doorway across space and time. All he would have to do is press the right button and he could walk away with a fresh start somewhere else. She cannot let that happen. Mary Jane then asks, what can they do to help? And Gwen says, by doing what they also do, play. How's it looking, Reed? And the Reed of Earth 65 gives her a thumbs up, telling her that all levels are set. Mics are hot and ready to record. Ladies, let's rock and roll. But later, across the way, Matt Murdock finds himself facing down against the ninjas of the hand. Even though he manages to cut down every one of them, he can bleed. He falls to his knees, getting ready to take out the sword that has been stuck in his stomach when he hears Gwen's voice telling him that it looks like it burns. Should she rub some salt in the wound for him? Matt begins to laugh, asking, you're alive? Of course you're alive! Why wouldn't you be? Especially when all the things are burning to the ground. It's like a moth to the flame. Matt grips the handle of the sword, ripping it out, tossing it to the side, telling her, You really are my most greatest student. I could have gone anywhere thanks to this little watch, but instead I stayed to show you, to teach you. You could be more. Gwen scoffs. Sure. You think that you're cursed, burdened by this great power, that no one is as free of you? Last week, you were the crime boss. This week, you're a ninja. Your whole life is a dress up. You're so bored and empty that you have to wear other people's pain like a costume. Matt listens to where Gwen's voice is coming from and he swings, but Gwen jumps back with a small device telling him, We're not doing this your way. No more dancing in circles. As the button is pressed, Matt begins to hear Gwen's band playing and he screams as he falls to his knees. Gwen asks, Can you hear it? The Mary Janes are rocking the center stage of your auditory cortex. Terrifying, isn't it? Being overwhelmed, drowned out. Matt rolls over, covering his ears, shouting, I will kill you if you don't turn it down. I hide in plain sight. Tell you that lies are truth, that strength is weakness. I even said that Venom feared sound. It was I who planted it in your headline, who dared you to test it. But it was I who was wagging my fear in your face. I needed the thrill of being caught. I was begging for someone to challenge me. Gwen presses the button to stop the music and then goes on stating, the world knows the truth now. So do I. This is the sound of the people that I love. The sound of who I am. And together, Venom and I have found our bond. We have found a balance. But for you, what do we even do with you? No court will convict you. No prison will hold you. Just give me a reason. A way to not end this in blood. Matt leans up telling her, The hand is coming. But I won't. I can't. Let. Not them. End this now. Or nothing will ever stop me. Gwen pulls the web watch from Matt's wrist and lets him drop to the floor, telling him, You picked your partners. Enjoy the dance. Later, as the police surround the corn dog place that Gwen worked at, Jean de Wolf says that for all it's worth, she knew, even in her office pool. Gwen asks, Really? Cool. You can pay for the corn dogs then. De Wolf says that she knows her father and he'd be proud of her for doing this. Are you ready? Gwen holds out her arms, telling her that she sure hopes so. And de Wolf puts cuffs on Gwen Stacy, telling her, you have the right to remain silent. Over the next several days, Gwen goes in and out of court, waiting to hear what she's been charged with. She wanted to show everyone that people need to be held responsible for their actions, herself included. But really, she isn't on trial for what she did. She's on trial for what Spider-Woman might do. Her peers are deciding if they want her on their streets. And with that, the ruling is read. The people of the court find Gwen Stacy guilty. Gwen's first day at the Shield Maximum Security Prison is rather, well, eventful. Instead of breaking in, she's walking down the halls like everyone else. She sees Cindy Moon and tries to sit with her, but Titania took it upon herself to welcome Gwen personally with her fists. Gwen thought about fighting it, but, well, she didn't. And Titania wasn't the only one looking for payback, Diamondback as well. 
But the one in charge of everyone, oddly enough, was Adrian Toombs, the Vulture. How the Vulture got to running the place is anyone's guess, but he does now. And so those days they turned to weeks, and the weeks they turned to months. The beatings, they didn't stop, and every time that Gwen thought about using her powers, she yelled back. And after some time, Gwen began to go along with it. Maybe that's what she was supposed to do. Show everyone that she could restrain herself. Doing that for so long did yield some results. Cap came in, stayed in the shield, would like to offer her a job. One where she can freely use her powers. The Venom Symbiote. Be a part of a team. Be someone working with the good guys. That she'd be allowed to leave this prison today. But they won't force her. The choice is hers to make. Gwen thought long and hard about it, and she simply said, No. She is here because their justice system is broken. And the only way out is to show that she can be held accountable for her actions as a vigilante. Not many people get a second chance, so when it comes time to leave, she can't just rush back out and make the same mistakes. She can't continue to put what led her out there into the world. The next time, she's going to do this the right way. The days continue to come and go until it becomes day 364, 23 hours and 59 minutes. One year has gone by with Gwen Stacy in prison, and now she can leave on her own. She screams! And when she looks around, she finds herself in a hospital room. She sighs, telling herself that it was just another nightmare. That she's out of that place now. That she doesn't need to remember something so bad. Just then, the door opens up and a man walks in stating that he is George Stacy's doctor. Doctor, it seems strange. If he could, he'd like to speak with her about her father. Before they send her father home, she must know that he's been doing incredibly well over the last few weeks. He wouldn't suggest trying out for the Knicks, but then again, it's not like he'd make them any worse. Her father was on the brink of death, gripping the ledge with only his fingernails. There is often a psychic cost for surviving such trauma. Anxiety, depression, denial. She must know that there have been some changes, but the fact is her father survived and that she's going to have to adjust to him to make sure that he stays on the path of recovery. As the two of them walk out, Gwen looks around stating that it's, and George finishes telling her, it's nice. It's nice and quiet. Gwen laughs, telling him that she expected a bazillion paparazzi asking a bazillion dumb questions, like what's next for the great George Stacy? And George gives a little light laugh, telling her, actually, I'm hungry. How about a dollar dog? Gwen thinks for a second, asking, isn't that on 65th Street? That's like 30 blocks. We could go if I carried you. And George tells her no. He'll race her there. Only a few blocks over, Gwen hangs from the street post, stating that they should probably just catch a cab. And George sits on the ground, trying to catch his breath, telling her that he's fine. He just, he needs to take a moment. He needs to breathe. Can she just come down from there? People are staring. Gwen asks, so let them. They're going to anyway. Nothing against the law about me taking a walk. George stares hard, telling her, get down. So Gwen stares right back. And George tells her, please. A short while later, Gwen tells George to slow down, but George pulls his arm away, telling her that he's fine. She stops asking, what is he trying to prove? What's with the attitude? And he yells at her. It's because you're still keeping secrets. You're still pretending I hadn't noticed. Your pet spiders have been in my shoes and pockets. Do you think that I've become some kind of child that needs protection? It's not your job to protect me, Gwen. So the two stop and they sit on the curb. And George asks, what happened to our lives? How did things end up like this? Is it my fault? The things I've said? The things I've taught you? How is it fair? What did you do to deserve any of this? Gwen sits down and asks, What was that line in that western you really liked? Deserves got nothing to do with it. Maybe we aren't the heroes that we thought we were. If we still hope to be, we can move forward. George then says that she knows how all of this works, no matter how hard she tries to do better. Try not to fight. Someone will come looking to fight her. Gwen tells him, yeah, they will. And maybe they'll even find it, but if the only way that I can help is with my fists, then I've already lost. I have to try this a different way. I have to know that I tried. George nods and tells her that she's right. He won't waste this chance on being a hypocrite. He's got her back. Just keep those damn spiders out of his shoes. He can protect himself. Now can we please eat? I've given you the steering wheel. Clearly I've gone insane. Gwen takes out her phone and tells him, sure, just let her get a... And George stops and tells her, no, no car. Let's get out of here your way. So later at Dollar Dog, sirens can be heard in the distance, and as the two listen, George says that it's fire sirens, not police. Gwen pauses for a moment and says, oh, and George smiles, telling her, just go, I love you. Gwen jumps up and hugs her father, telling him that she loves him too, and goodbye, everyone. George watches as Gwen swings off and looks at the spider on his hand, stating that she always wanted a dog. 
A few blocks over, the fire rages through a building as one of the firemen assists helping another one up the wall. Command radios in that they have to leave, but the firemen tell them that there's nothing that anyone can do, but there's still someone trapped inside, and the fireman continues to pull the rope as he coughs, just as a second fireman gets close to the ledge and the line snaps. The man scrambles, running, calling out for his partner, and just then through the window, he can see something. The smoke clears, and in front of him is a hooded woman holding his partner. The man asks, who is she? She pulls back her hood, telling him that she's always wanted to say this, but her? She's Spider-Gwen. And there you have it. We have completed where she's at right now. Now, they did pick the series up again after this. She's going to college in the main universe with Peter Parker and all of them. And she's currently involved in the King in Black series. So if you want to know what's happening with more Ghost Spider stuff, hit subscribe on the channel. Don't forget to hit that like button. And I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.